at uh, 702 approximately. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. All right, fire evacuation announcement. Uh, behind you is the main doors for fire evacuation. Right straight out, please. Also, you can go through these set of doors right here and down the stairs and out, uh, out the bottom. And please, if there is a, a, an issue, please walk away from the building as far as possible. Thank you very much. The secretary, please call the roll. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Louis Fiore? Here. Virginia Higley? Here. Linda DeGray? Here. Uh, Francis Alimo? Here. Kiran Majmudar? Here. Kenneth Helensky? Here. Vinny Grillo? Is absent. Uh, Christian D'Antonio? Here. Nicholas Lefakis? Here. And John Petronella is here. Thank you. Let the record show that all the members other than alternate Grillo are here. I believe that. Um, Director Plan, we'd like to make a quick announcement here before we do the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to introduce Matt Davis, who is our new assistant town planner. He comes with a wealth of experience, and uh, I'm extremely happy that he's here to help us along the way. So I don't know if you want to say anything real quick or oh. if you want. No, I don't, I don't want to take your time. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, too. Uh, looking forward to meeting all of you. and members of the public over the coming months, and I'll leave it at that for now. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome aboard, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Approval of minutes for the April 14th regular meeting. I'll uh, take a motion. Have, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. We did. Oh, did. Yeah. Oh, right. Yep, that's okay. <laughs> Approval of minutes for April 14th. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. It's moved by Commissioner Helinski. Is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Limo. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Any corrections or discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of April 14th? Aye. 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 Let the record show is unanimous for approving the minutes April 14th. Zoning enforcement report? I don't believe there is one tonight. Nothing that you want to add, Lori? Nothing? Okay. Now we're going to get to the public participation. <clears throat> At this point in the meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission welcomes comments, concerns, and opinions related to the planning and zoning in Enfield from anyone who is present, provided that no one may discuss any matter of business at this time that is already elsewhere on the agenda, any matter that is part of an open public hearing of the commission, or any matter where a decision of the commission may be pending, and that includes uh, legally pending. Uh, please, uh, if you haven't signed in, I'm not sure if anybody wants to speak at this point or they're waiting for the other. Please, come on up. Karen LaPlante, 166 North Maple Street. Can Karen, you hear can you me? pull it closer? Yeah. Is it on? Yep. Okay. It, well, the red light's on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that Saturday is hazardous waste day. We haven't had it in a while, and I'm sure if everybody digs through their uh, garages and closets and things, they can find some hazardous waste to bring into the town garage from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And... You don't all have to line up at 8 o'clock. You'll all get in. <laughs> so if everybody can uh, free the world of some, some of the hazardous waste and properly dispose of it at the town garage. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Anybody else for public participation? Good evening, Commissioners. Angela Foss, 16 Crescent Beach Drive. So I missed the last planning and zoning meeting because I was enjoying myself in North Carolina with my brother on vacation. We had a great time. It's beautiful down there. As I had done prior to the last time I spoke, I, went to let, I want to let you know that I did go home and I did listen to the remainder of the meeting again and was very pleased that you, Lou, mentioned me at the end of the meeting. Thank you. As I had stated, I left copies of my questions, my phone number, and my email addresses, and I really expected a response from somebody to my questions. But I don't know if you are aware of this, I did not get any response. I even called and left a message with Lori Witten. 
I left it on our voicemail, and I haven't heard a thing. So I have learned that we as residents do not get answers by asking them at these meetings, not by putting questions in writing and leaving them with staff, not by leaving our phone number and email, which leaves what? What are the town guidelines in responding to residents? If I receive a call from a parent professionally, I'm expected to get back to them within 24 hours. In this case, in the same town, I have been waiting over a month for an answer. I'm sure that you did not expect to hear that from me. I believe that you are all really good people, but you are being misled or misguided to make decisions to approve projects based on only a site plan on a building that really requires a special permit. Listen, I appreciate your work here, and I've said it over and over again, and I know that I, I understand that you know that I'm genuine with this. But um, it does not need, but your work here, it does need to be accurate, and it needs to follow the regulations. My questions that I had asked were regarding 113 North Maple Street and the required special permit according to the regulations for Agrimark. Have you required a special permit in this case? If so, awesome. I would love to hear about it. If not, who is responsible for 113 North Maple Street to be put onto a special permit, which is required? According to the Enfield Zoning Regulations, page 56, section 620, it clearly states that as a company, Agrimark, a dairy distributor falls under the use agricultural products manufacturing and storage under the I-1 district that requires a special permit. Please follow up on these requirements and please somebody get back to me. Thank you. Jeffrey Foss, 16 Crescent Beach Drive, also her husband. Uh, Enfield and I just my comment is basically I'm the landlord in Enfield who has businesses when I decide that I want to put a business into one of my empty spaces I have to come to the town of Enfield and ask permission for a restaurant or a vape shop or something of that nature going into one of my empty spaces but why can somebody come into the town of Enfield to put a large facility in and not even tell you what they're going to be putting in that facility. How does that ethically make any sense? Why would a building be approved, any kind of structure, any large structure, and not have background as to what's going in that facility? That's my question for you. And I really think if something gets approved, then that's unethical. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public participation? Any other public participation? For the last final time, any other public participation? Seeing none, public participation is closed. Move on to public hearing PH3034MA. Hold on, Mr. Secretary, please. It's, hold on, Mr. Secretary. Yep. Um, it, it's been, um, I'm not sure he has to read this at this point because the applicant has asked us to please table this until one of the next planning and zoning meetings due to the fact that they're working on some other things and, and they asked us to hold off on that. So I would accept or someone to please make a motion to table so PH 3034MA. So moved. Motion sure. made by uh, Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner Majmandar to table PH 3034MA. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Seeing it was unanimous to table uh, this particular application to a future meeting. Having said that, Mr. Secretary, we're ready to go on to PH 3037. Very good. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, will hold public hearings at the regular meeting on Thursday, April 28, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application. Public hearing number 3037, 50 Weymouth Road, special use permit application to establish a farm brewery to allow manufacturing and storage of retail sale of craft beer. Charles Mastroberti, Applicant owner map 16 lot 111 R44 zone. Thank you. Is there applicant or the representative here? Yes. Thank you. 
please identify yourself for the record and, and pull the mic closer to you and make sure it's on, please. Thank you. Charlie Masterbirdie, 50 Weymouth Road, Enfield, Connecticut. Thank you. Could you please briefly uh, outline you know, your request tonight? Yes. Um, according to House Bill um, that the state passed, 5928, we request a special permit to allow for a farm brewery located at Muddy Foot Farm, 50 Weymouth Road, Enfield, Connecticut. This would include the manufacture and sale of craft beer for consumption on the premises of the farm brewery. This would also include the tasting of free samples of craft, uh, craft beer. We would adhere to all general statutes pertaining to the Connecticut uh, craft beer bill passed into law. We will also adhere to Enfield's farm brewery and winery regulations pertaining to section 4.90 of the zoning regulations. We will have a small indoor tap room, which will include seating for approximately 20 people. Ample space will also be available for outdoor seating. Uh, accommodations for parking will be available for about 15 to 20 cars. We will also have a designated area available for food trucks, but only one truck at a time. Um, occasionally, there will only be acoustic uh, music for entertainment. Not the commission for questions or concerns. Commissioner Hadley? I just have one question. Um, if you have 20 people, you know, on a good day, say you're very busy and you have 20 people, and then you have um, seating for 50 people outside, um, you have 20 parking spaces, where will the overflow park? Um, if, if you look at the... Uh, parking area there's plenty of room to do another row um, either in the center okay. thank you You're welcome Mr. Masvidar? yeah I just don't want you to come back for more stuff but do you need a special visit back here for a sign or something that you will have Somewhere along the road? Yes. You do need to. You um, can do it right now. Oh, okay. If, uh, I'm just trying not to have you yeah, come back. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to see you. But anyway, just to mention, in case there is a way you could do it, number two, what's a date we could come and taste? <laughs> Hopefully soon. <laughs> um, thank you. But you, yes, the uh, sign definitely was overlooked. So... Um, I'd like to apply for that. Just a small sign by the road. Can't. Can't. You'll have to come back. Okay. Questions from other commissioners? Commissioner Holinsky? Uh, yeah. Could you elaborate on your uh, use of the food truck on the property? I mean, how, how often it would be there? I know, you, I know you did give a summary here, but I just, just wanted to hear from, from yourself. You know, what was, what's your intent on the food shelf? Uh, not the food shelf. <laughs> food I used truck. to work for the food shelf. <laughs> but... Uh, the uh, food truck itself. Yeah. You know, how, how many times would you use it? Uh, it probably would you change it from time to time. Would it be a different food truck? Cor uh, correct, because it would be not us running it. It would be just outside sources so that we would think? use. Okay. And it would probably be limited to just Fridays and Saturdays. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Fakus. Yes. What are your planned hours of operation, please? Oh, um, I included that in the summary. Uh, sorry, Thursdays three to eight, Fridays three to nine, Saturdays noon to nine, and Sundays twelve to six. Antonio. Yep. So just to confirm, as far as actual development of the site, so you have the building there already. Uh, you have the lot there already, yes. the gravel lot. So it's really just the the pads for outdoor seating, really two concrete pads. Is Correct. That right? Yes. Okay. Right. Do you um, are you planning to demarcate uh, the parking spots? Um, I, I, the only concern I would have with the parking would just be the handicap. You know, having a demarcation for those. Uh, we will definitely have the something. demarcation for one handicap spot. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. The rest we're going to try to... Probably a sign, right? Because right. gravel, you're probably it, not painting exactly. the gravel. Got right. it. Okay. But so, yeah, minimal uh, minimal changes to the site itself. Correct. Right? Right. 
Thanks. I, I had, you know, could you please just state for the record again, we did receive some documentation that specifically specifies the things that you are producing right now on the farm. Could you please specify for the record what those are, please? Um, honey, we, we were, um, I'm trying to think, we, we were selling Christmas trees for a number of years, mm -hmm. um, and also plants and vegetables. Okay. We plan on, um, on the back side of that lot is going to be um, all fruit trees, and we're probably going to have a pick your own spot for fruits. Okay. And I found that just, again, because since coming on in January, this was some enhancements to the regulations by the prior commission. Um, I know that Commissioner D'Antoni, Commissioner Holinsky, Commissioner Lefakis, and myself were not part of that. And I, Majumdar was a, a, Commissioner Majumdar was an alternate then. So this was something generally you guys worked on um, to enhance or the availability of farms or agricultural areas to be able to generate additional income, and make right. it more self-sustaining. Yes. And you do recognize a little bit that in that part of uh, Weymouth Road is a little, I would say a little, I don't want to say dangerous, but in my opinion, Weymouth Road and Booth Road are probably the last two east to west roads that really need to be improved. I think you would kind of agree with that, I'm sure. Yes, but where we're located is probably the least densely populated area of Weymouth Road. Right, there's houses to the east of you and to the west of you. Is, is there anything in the back of your property? Does that reach into one of the properties no. in the back? No, okay. I did drive by, but of course I wasn't going to get out and walk in the back of your property. <laughs> Any other questions at this point from the commission? No. Good. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak for or against this particular application? Say anyone in the public who would like to speak for or against this application? Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak for and against this application? Seeing none. Again, there's no questions, but we might as well stay here. Does the staff have any questions or comments at this point? One <laughs> um, there were some comments um, from health and uh, police and I believe fire. So I would like those uh, comments to be um, part of the conditions of approval, if you would not mind. And as soon as I find it, I could. Oh, I got back to it. I could tell you what they are. <laughs> yes, because we don't we don't have those in, in our. You should have re received a second staff report. Did you not receive that? No, we did not. Oh. Okay. I apologize for that. It's okay. So the second staff report, um, because we got some some uh, additional comments from the other departments. So water pollution control was concerned about how they were going to hook up to the sewer. Um, the health um, requires that the building be hooked up to the sewer. The proposed water supply uh, needs to be listed as well. Um, they talk about whether it's public or, or private, and a well permit will be required if it is a well. And then, um, where is the police? So uh, traffic or police um, said they had no further concerns for parking because they had some up front. They wanted to reiterate that a MUTCD stop sign should be added to the eggs added at the exit of the facility onto Weymouth Road and that handicapped spaces should be marked and signed per the guidelines and state statute and handicapped signage should be permanently installed. And we just made note that uh, the wetlands agency found that there was no reason to um, require a wetlands permit as this was an exempt activity and there was really no construction or yeah. grading. Yeah, we did receive that. Yes. Yeah, we did receive that. You did receive it. Oh, yeah. thank, thank goodness. Yeah. I really thought that, that it went out to you. <laughs> so. so. Would you like to respond to some of those? Yes, yes please. please. Be my guest. Um, as far as the um, well is concerned, we're, we're 
hooking up to the existing well that's there, and I did call the health department, and they said there's no problem with hooking up to the existing well. So whoever um, made the comments there didn't realize that there is an existing well on the property that we've been using for 18 years. Okay. What about the sewer? But we'll be hooking up to our own line. I mean, we, we have our own line that runs down, and, and yeah, yeah. I was told there would be no problem hooking up to that also. Because if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, your, your home is actually there also. Correct. correct. So you're going to hook up to your own personal home correct. sewer line out to yes. the road. We own that, so it's a lot yeah. cheaper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should we make that a, 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 a condition? Just I, I would just uh, request that the staff comments be part of the conditions of part approval. Part of the record. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Mm -hmm. any, any more questions or comments from the commissioners? this point, make a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner DeGray, seconded by Commissioner Second. Higley to close the public hearing. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Let the record show that it was unanimous to close the public hearing. Make a motion to approve. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve uh, public hearing number 30 uh, 3750 Weymouth Road special use permit application to establish a farm brewery to allow manufacturing and storage of retail sale of craft beer. A Charles Master Berti applicant owner, map 16, lot 111, R44 zone, uh, with the uh, 28 conditions listed and uh, also uh, with the uh, staff comments, uh, also dated with the uh, um, uh, staff report dated uh, April 28, 2022. Motion made by Secretary Petronello, seconded by Commissioner Holinsky. No discussion on that? Then roll call vote, please, Mr. Secretary, whenever you're ready. Uh, Lou Fiore? Four. Linda DeGray? Four. Virginia Higley? Four. Francis Salimo? Four. Uh, Kiran Majmudar? Four. Uh, Ken Holinsky? Four. Uh, John Petronella is four. Thank you. Seeing it's <coughs> unanimous approval for this application, you're all set to begin work with staff, and good luck with you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Based on the fact that item C is going to be taking up some time tonight and we have other applicants here, I'm requesting that someone please make a motion to move 9A, B, and C above uh, uh, public hearing number C. So moved. Okay. Most, okay. Most, motion made by seconded. Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner DeGray to move all the items in nine above uh, public hearings number C. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Showed it's unanimous. Karam, are you in favor of that? Come on. I didn't see his vote. Yeah. Yeah. Were you in favor of that? Aye. Aye. Uh, thank I'm you. <laughs> Let us show that it was unanimous. So we'll move on to new business. Um, SPR 1885, which is a site plan review to modify previous approved plan to raise overall evaluations, develop elevations of the site and building modifications, and fill housing authority owner applicant map 75 lot 2, I1 zone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Scott Bertrand, uh, Executive Director of Enfield Housing Authority, 1 Pearson Way, Enfield, Connecticut. And I have with me Ben Wheeler from Design Professionals and David Holmes uh, with uh, Capital Studios Architect. Uh, we have a previously approved um, plan, uh, but as with most plans, you get further and further along, and we're at 99, 98.5. Five, whatever we want to call it, percent uh, with the drawings and plans, and we needed to do uh, request some site plan modifications uh, to adjust for that. And with that, uh, David, are you going to present that first? I, I'll talk about the building. Oh, sure. Uh, is this working? Yeah, that's fine. No. That should, that should, should be working. Is it on? or? It takes a second sometimes. Oh, thank you. Here we go. Yeah, you're right. a nice guy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, for the record, my name is David Holmes. I'm one of the principals at Capital Studio Architects in East Hartford. 
been a pleasure working with the Enfield Housing Authority for quite some time on this really exciting project, as well as the, uh, your group is, and, and staff's been really, really helpful as well. And Scott mentioned, as with some projects, uh, particularly ones like this, which the construction cost is going to exceed well over $20 million, a lot of times you have to um, tighten your belt a little bit to make all the numbers work. And Ben will address the, the site plan, the site changes, and I would like to just talk quickly about uh, the, the, build, the building changes. They're relatively minor, and I think uh, actually even though we, we made the changes to slightly reduce the construction cost, I think they really make a, a better project and a better building. And I think the average person uh, with, with an untrained eye wouldn't even realize that we made the changes. Uh, building A, which is th the building you see here, is a building with the community room. Um, we eliminated half of the basement and made the building um, slab on grade from here over. Uh, the building, if you remember, on one end is three stories and the other end is two stories. And we originally had an entire basement under the, the, the whole building. Um, and for value engineering reasons, we reduced, uh, eliminated the basement here and put the ground floor units on slab. Uh, we also reduced the overall fo footprint in both buildings A and B by 5%. And we did that simply by... Um, uh, reducing the corridor width. The building's a double loaded corridor with stairs at either end. So we just reduced the corridor width and took 5% of the building footprint out. So the building's actually just slightly smaller than what we had previously got approved. Um, we had at one time uh, this ground floor, these walls were sloped out slightly. Um, the faux masonry was at a, at a bit of an angle. We eliminated that and made it straight. Uh, we The, the dormers... <coughs> Uh, we had originally had round dormers on the buildings. We've um, made those into shallow arches. Um, when I say round dormers, that meant that the the curve came out from the front of the building, and now it's just arched in a different direction. Uh, we changed the exterior decks from semicircular to angled bays with two support columns instead of three. We raised the elevation of the ground floor of both buildings by 5%, which meant that we had um, had to remove less soil from the site, which saves a considerable amount of money. At the community building, we um, this is the community building, that was originally curved at one end, and we basically squared it off. And we eliminated um, a pergola that was outside the community building. All the exterior buildings, uh, all the exterior building materials are the same as we had originally proposed, and really our, our design philosophy or our design strategy about the architectural language of the building has not changed at all. These were all just very minor changes in our opinion to help reduce the cost so that the project uh, made sense from a funding point of view. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Ben. Thank you, David. Uh, for the record, Ben Wheeler. I'm a uh, licensed landscape architect in the state of Connecticut and uh, work for Design Professionals Incorporated. Um, our firm was responsible, uh, and the engineers in our firm was responsible for preparing the site plans, both with the original application and the application before you this evening. Um, as far as the site changes are concerned, uh, from a zoning perspective, uh, really not much has changed. The number of units has stayed the same from the previous application at 99 units. The layout of the of the uh, facility is the same. Uh, the number of parking spaces has stayed the same. Really, the the biggest change from a site perspective is, as David alluded to, uh, the original plan resulted in a uh, fairly significant amount of export of uh, material from the site. Uh, meaning that we were cutting more than we were filling. So in order to save on that trucking cost and, and expense, uh, we, we did raise the site a foot and then also um, added an earthen berm in between uh, Building B, which is uh, the, the northern of the two buildings on, on your plan, uh, and the, uh, the homes, the residences that are uh, along Route 5. So it, it actually enhances the plan um, because it does provide a little more of a, a screening effect in between uh, the buildings uh, and, and the uh, and those residences. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, not much has changed from from a site perspective. Um, I'm sure in your staff report you do see that we also uh, applied to the uh, wetlands agency and did get their approval recently. 
as a result of raising the site, we did grade a little bit closer to the wetlands, but it, it was minor uh, in their eyes, and so they did approve the changes as well. Um, so that is basically it, and, and obviously we're uh, available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Scott, anything? or? No, that, that pretty much sums up the changes. Uh, the exciting project, it's been something we've been working on for a number of years. Uh, when you're doing something like this, it's a little slower than we'd, we'd like it to be, but it's been our effort since we first were back here, I think it was in uh, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the process of applying for the funding. Uh, we're partnering with the town on some of that. Um, we've added some enhancements. Uh, um, I don't want to bore you with too many details, but uh, Go ahead. we're actually uh, uh, have got some project-based uh, funding going into it where we're going to dedicate five units towards veterans, veteran supportive housing units, which is a very exciting piece that we'll be able to add into that. And we'll be applying um, for uh, HUD. It's a HUD program for, um, for the elderly. Uh, so looking at getting some of that there as well. And... Um, it's a basically assembling probably seven or eight different pools of, of funds and uh, a lot of work. Very excited about it. But I do believe it's going to greatly enhance that area. Uh, what's there has been there since 1964. Uh, it originally didn't quite fit that neighborhood. I remember driving by as a kid and saying, that just doesn't quite quite add. And uh, it's, uh, it doesn't suit the needs of the seniors today. They're very small units. Uh, this is the same things I've been saying for, for the 20 years I've been with the Housing Authority. It's the last piece of our puzzle. We've got every other unit and every other site sustainable on a, on a plan. We've done renovations and upgrades. This is the, the, the last piece of the puzzle. So that's where we're at. Great. Thank you for that background information. Thanks. I remember it well, having yeah. grown up basically across the street. I remember when those were built. <laughs> seems like yesterday. Remember the butterfly roofs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems like yesterday, that whole facility. Um, open up for a question for the commission. Mr. DeGray, go ahead. Um, just quick question because I did take a ride through there today mm -hmm. and I see it's pretty full. What do we what is your timeline for construction and what are you going to do with those people that are still living sure. in those? So the construction timeline is depending on when the approval of the financing. So if everything were perfect, we would probably be looking to break ground in, in 2023. It, it takes at least six, nine months to close, even when you're approved for the, the, the various funding cycles that come through. As far as relocation, what we've done is we've contracted with a professional relocation company. At this point in time, we're letting the occupancy of the site drop down. In other words, if somebody moves out, we're not filling a, a unit. Uh, I believe, and don't hold me to this one, but uh, I, I think about 70 of the 80 apartments there are currently occupied. And we're required under the Uniform Relocation Act to come up with a relocation plan. So we've hired a firm out of Boston, and that's all they do is they do re relocation planning. So there's a few things we do. The first would be if we can demo one side, we'll move everybody to one side of the site where the apartments are, demo those buildings, build one building, not sure which one it'll be, then move people over to the other side of the site and then demo the, the existing units there and build that second building. It's not a phased project as far as financing, things like that, but that would be the construction flow. We also have the benefit of having uh, another 120 elderly units here in town. And so as those unit turns turn over, we'll be able to relocate people to those units in the meantime. And then if people want the option of going back, they can do that. The last strategy would be temporary relocation off a site. Okay, and one more thing sure. is uh, fire said there you need a fire hydrant on the plan that they didn't see. Yeah, and I, and I spoke to uh, uh, Shirley way back with this, and it's really going to be dependent on where the final connection has to be for the sprinkler system. And it, there's, I don't know the regulation, uh, but I know it's a certain number of feet that would have to be added, and I believe that's why we're going to place that hydrant once we know exactly where that will be. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Higley? Mine is more of an observation. First of all, the buildings are beautiful, and I'm glad that you're able to start sooner rather than later. And I'm also glad that you're putting solar on the roofs because we don't see that very often in new buildings, so it's great that you're doing that. I'm sorry, I meant to mention that. I apologize. Yeah, the solar is uh, it's something that, that's very helpful to work in there to keep the utility costs down on the site. Thank you. Commissioner Marginer, sorry. Yeah, just a very minor comment on the site plan. I'm looking at the site plan, building A, as I'm looking on the screen, it's on the right-hand side. And this is probably nothing to do with planning and zoning, but there is a 
of what appears to be an A-shaped concrete walkway type thing. Yes. I it, couldn't quite figure out what it does. It, it's it's uh, actually an accessible route. Um, as Mr. Holmes had mentioned, oh, each end of that floor. building uh, has an exit stairway. There are actually stairs located there because of the grade change. So I it's an accessible okay. route to make sure that uh, you know anybody can make egress down to uh, that circular road. Wonderful. I couldn't figure that out. But thank you very much. And yes, the site definitely needs enhancement. This looks like great enhancement. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up a bit on Commissioner DeGray's uh, uh, question about, about the people who live there now, is there a plan to move them out and have them reside someplace else during construction? Is, or how is, would that work? So, uh, as I, I maybe I'll be a little bit more clear. So, if we, for example, were to, able to do Building A yep. first, we would move everybody to any vacant units that are over on the other side of the property. Okay. And then the next thing, uh, and then build that building, and then move people from there over to that completed building, 15. then demo the mm -hmm. second side, section of the site, and, and then build the other building. We also, as units become vacant at our other properties, such as Ella Grasso Manor, um, Woodside Park, Windsor Court, we would use those as units where we could relocate people either on a temporary or permanent basis, depending on what their choice would be. So that way, nobody will be displaced. And in fact, the, the, the laws are very, pretty strict on that on the uniform. So you have right. enough capacity to be able to move people, relocate them while you're building? We believe so at this point in time for the attrition that we normally have. We, we know that we, we have a certain number of people move out per year. And as I had mentioned uh, earlier, maybe I didn't mention, we've stopped leasing uh, units at Enfield Manor. So that way okay. we've already dropped the, the occupancy down from 80 to 70. Okay. And that's only been over the past uh, five, six months. And so it'll drop even more. So there'll be less people that'll be impacted as far as a move. Okay, great. Thank no, you. No good questions, because that's one of the first ones we get, and, and we definitely have to take care of the people. That's why we're doing this. One thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think Chris was before. Yeah. Chris, and Tony. I, I have two questions. One is, uh, one is more towards the original site plan, so I, just out of uh, just confirmation, I can tell from the site plan, it looks like you guys are extending the sidewalk walkway from the driveway all the way up to Route 5 which it, it doesn't connect to the Route 5 crosswalk. Is that, can you confirm that? Currently, it does not connect. Mm -hmm. And I don't know this for a fact, but what I was told from the historical point of view, that's actually on at about the point where the state land takes over. Mm -hmm. There's a setback, I guess, along Route yep. 5 to a yep. certain point. And that's why whenever that was done, it was before my tenure, that's why the stop sign, uh, I'm sorry, the sidewalk ended. And it would be our intention per the plans to be able to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested. Uh, that that would be ideal. I think that that ought to be the I case. And I kind of just want to. It? Yeah, it, it's in the site plan as going yep. up to the street. So the discrepancy, I just wanted to kind of confirm. Um, and maybe maybe just a note for the record and staff because it's outside your control. But that crosswalk, there's a crosswalk to cross Route Five, but it doesn't go anywhere. There's no sidewalk to the actual sidewalk. Um, so again, that's not your responsibility. It's uh, private property, no doubt, on the other side of the road. Uh, but I think that's just kind of something that the town ought to look into, um, or you know, with the with the state. State. State owns that to the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. The town to coordinate with the state. Um, thanks. Um, as far as uh, the updates, so just the question about the solar. Are you planning for the? Are you building that capacity to cover your entire facility's usage, or is it just a proportion? It hasn't been spec'd out completely. We're looking at a couple of different things. At a minimum, we want to just reduce the, the usage on the site because that certainly helps the financial side of it. But we are looking at the possibility of a, a, a newer uh, idea that's out there is where you're building capacity towards resilient power, where you actually build in battery backups. Right, in fact, right. we got a, a, a grant um, um, through a private nonprofit that wants to build resiliency to, to do the feasibility of the batteries. Just landed on our desk, so probably about a week ago, we're trying to digest that, because that, that's a whole nother venture. So we're being open to it, but the intent is, is to minimize the amount of power that we uh, have to buy for the site, because that helps the financials and helps keep the rents down. Sure, sure. Yep. Great, yeah, I oh, applaud sure. you yeah. for that. So just, just to expand on uh, what Scott said a little bit, the units are individually metered. Mm -hmm. And so the goal would be to get all of this, 
all of the electrical that would be on an owner's panel on solar, which would include quarter lights, exit lights, elevators, uh, sight lighting, um, those kinds of issues. Um, the units are, are designed uh, very ener energy efficiently, and we're using a, a mechanical system for heating and cooling called ductless splits. You may be familiar with those. They are electric, but they're extremely efficient. And I meant to mention during my presentation too, all 99 of the units will be designed to meet the requirements for people with physical disabilities, even though the building code only requires 10%. Um, every unit is gonna be designed for people who could use a wheelchair because it's an elderly development primarily and um, it just seems like good judgment and the right thing to do. Great, thank you. All set. Commissioner Lima? Yeah, thank you. Scott, you were talking about before the phases and you were gonna be moving people in and moving people mm -hmm. out. So we had something before us just a couple of weeks ago and it had to do with phasing in COs. Um, looks like this is gonna be done in different stages. So I don't want that to come up again and because it was a little bit of a hiccup with um, mm. the AAA building. Mm -hmm. yep. So I don't know if we have that here that's gonna take care of them able to actually open up one of the buildings while another building is being constructed. Um, just staff, has that um, been looked at? Because that was a little bit of a hiccup. It, well, this is a little bit different than the AAA situation. Um, I, this, if they build one building and they move people in, that would be fine. And so they can get the CO for that one that building. building, and then they well, demolish the rest of the site. Okay. Yeah, so I can tell you. It's a little bit more straightforward. Okay. Good yeah, just, I can tell you with great confidence that it, uh, we're calling it a phased approach, but it would be seamless. Mm -hmm. We would go from completing one building to beginning the next. And clearly the building code allows for us to get a certificate of occupancy for the first completed building before the second building is completed. And there's also another option called a temporary certificate of occupancy, mm -hmm. TCO. Mm -hmm. We don't like those, but uh, if there was an issue, say that, I don't know what it would be, but, but th clearly we're, we will have the ability to get the first building legally occupied before the second building is completed. Good. I just raised that because I didn't want to have to see you guys come back no. for something else. And I don't know if it have any bearing on that or not, but you know, some of the primary funding that we're going for is through the state of Connecticut and the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. Mm -hmm. And they have certain design standards and rules that are probably above in some cases and beyond even what yeah. building codes require. So yeah. they're, we're going to be monitored and looked at from every direction. As long as it's, we talked about it and it's not overlooked and you guys can just go nope. right ahead and move along. It's not. In an ideal world, we would build both buildings at one time because if sure. you can shorten yeah. the construction activity, the construction period, yeah. there's a significant savings. But our construction manager and working with uh, Scott and his staff compared the additional cost to do one building than the next versus the cost to relocate all the residents to somewhere and it was more cost beneficial to do one building, complete it, and then do the next mm -hmm. building. A big logistical uh, project, <laughs> for sure. Yes. That, that's Good luck. What, that's why we hired, a, we hired a company to handle that part of the relocation, and th that's all they do. I'm excited to see it. It was really a long time coming, and it's going to be very nice. I really like it. Any other comments? I guess I just had, I guess I just had a couple. Uh, <clears throat> just to get to staff comments, um, just to enhance that. Um, one of the things that was mentioned to us is that um, a landscape maintenance plan should be submitted. Um, I'm not sure if we really need to make that a condition or not, or whether you guys would realize that that should be uh, submitted to us. There was some questions about the berm, about how that's going to be handled, so maybe you want to Sure, I, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, first of all, in, our, in the notes and the plans on the landscape plan, um, and in the technical specifications for this project, which are much more detailed than, than the plans that become before the commission. Yeah, yeah. Um, when the landscape contractor is selected, they're required to provide a one-year warranty uh, for any plant material that goes in, and that's not just the plants on the berm, that's any plant material. And then at the end of that one-year warranty, if anything is, is dead or uh, failing, then they're required to replace that and extend that warranty for another growing season. Um, so that does offer some protections. Uh, to, usually once a plant survives the first growing season, it has a very large survivability rate uh, past that. Um, so that's why we, we include that on all our projects. Um, as far as the, you know, the species in, in particular, uh, we did select white pines um, because they, they do tend to, of uh, the evergreen trees, you know, have a good 
um, uh, growth rate mm -hmm. um, and provide that screening between those buildings and residences. Uh, certainly, however, you know if uh, the commission or staff, you know, feel there an alternate species would be better in those locations, we'd we'd be happy to uh, we'd be open to that. But that that is why we selected white pine. And, and again, with with that warranty period, you know, we feel comfortable that uh, you know making it past that first season and, and surviving that, uh, you know, they'll they'll be set up for success long term. Just out of curiosity, I couldn't quite tell in the plans I have. Where, where is the berm going east? I'm assuming north, south. It's it's on the north side of the site. Um, so I noticed I noticed site pretty well. Yeah. So so where the extension is, right? You know how the extension yeah. runs north south. Yeah. It would be probably as you're driving down there to the left side. Right. And the building would be to the right. Okay. Knowing the site, if you're yep. the landmarks, yep. you can. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I know we did talk about the watering in, in during the first year being the most important. And, and we're going to have maintenance, you know, uh, as we have now, either contracted out or in-house. And I don't see any issue why they, they wouldn't be able to make sure they get watered on a that needed regular basis. The, the other item I had is um, the extension. I mean, basically, as was pretty alluded to here from staff, I'll actually read the comment here. The applicant received an extension for start of construction by obtaining a building permit. This was extended to February 28th, 2021, so that's a year ago, and it has expired. So the commission should consider granting an additional extension for the applicant. Should we do that at this point in time, or should that be a separate um, discussion? Um, no, it, it would be appropriate to do it now for a two-year extension. Okay. I picked up on that it expired last month, because we did come once for an extension in 2020. Yeah, just just lapsed for to be came for the two year extension, but thank you for catching that. <laughs> no, I. I <laughs> <laughs> and you're prepared to, uh, you guys are prepared to work with the state for that crosswalk. I mean, basically, that's that's a state issue as you well. I'm sure you're well aware. And I know the sidewalk ends because at one time I actually owned a home right next right next to the sidewalk. Oh, Jesus. Many many years ago, we we re re had that house and lived there for a few years and sold it. So I know where the sidewalk ends. And I know, as uh, Commissioner D'Antoni mentioned, even if you get the crosswalk, it doesn't connect to anything on the other side, which really kind of isn't your issue. But um, you will have to work with them to get that, that, that sidewalk extended out to the road. We certainly can advocate strongly for that. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's about all you can do, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I carefully use the word advocate because yeah, yeah. They, they, they do what they want to do. Right? Yeah, very good. Is the commission done? Is staff, any, any comments on this? No, I think... Uh, Overall, they were really minor changes, so, but good changes. Okay. So, we have no concerns. Is there make a motion to approve? Don't we have to close it? No, it's not, public, it's not a public hearing. So moved. Yeah. Uh, the, he's got to read, read, read it first, yes. Uh, 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 Mr. Chair, are we going to have a separate vote on the extension? I'm not, I, that's why I'm looking at staff. Should we have a separate vote on extension or include that with disapproval? <clears throat> what would your recommendation be? <laughs> If you feel that it will be awarded, then you could just do it as as part of the conditions of approval. A discussion before a discussion on before does anyone have do any it separately? You can. Yeah, does anyone have any agit about granting the extension for this particular project? I'm the looking only, around. Yep. The only thing on the extension: should we make sure that we're giving them enough, so in case they run into a problem and run out again? Where do we go in two years, or could we go more yeah. than two? Or yeah, two years. Who's the two maximum? Years. Yeah, two years. Okay. You're good two with years. two. That's going to be all right. If not, I'll be back again. Yeah, don't forget. <laughs> right. Lori will right. call you. Right. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Right. Thanks. So well, I guess uh, looking around us for some consensus is how mm -hmm. we want to go. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it sounds like we want to approve this uh, with yeah. the uh, same time granting the extension for the 2024. Right. So I'll make a motion to approve uh, uh, SPR number 1885 uh, uh, in, in conformance with the resolution prepared by town staff dated uh, April 28, 2022 um, with the 26 conditions listed and also with a two-year extension to the previously approved uh, extension as to uh, when a building permit can be applied for. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Holinsky. Any discussion on that? Any discussion? Nope. Seeing none. Mr. Secretary, when you're ready, roll call vote, yep. please. Uh, Lou Fiore. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Francis Salimo. Four. Kiran Majmudar. Four. Ken Holinsky. 
Four. And John Petronella is four. But the record shows unanimous, 7 nothing. Good Thank to you see very you. much. Thank, Thank you very much, you Commissioner. Good luck Thanks. with the project. Good to see you. I think it's too high. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the handbag. <laughs> no, it's the, my seat's too high. I'm hitting the. Okay, when everyone's ready, everyone's all set. Mm -hmm. Moving on to SPR 18888 140-148 Hazard Avenue, site plan review to modify previous approved plans to replace a one-story building with a two-story building. And in addition, Johnson Memorial Hospital, Inc., owner applicant, map 65, lot 69, mm -hmm. BP zone, map 65, lot 90, R44 zone. The applicants or the representative, please come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Please identify yourselves for the record. You might need to pull the mic a little closer to you yep. if you can. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, Tony Armelin, uh, facilities manager for Johnson Memorial Hospital. <laughs> Stu Rosenberg, president of Johnson Memorial Hospital in Stafford Springs. And Dana. Oh, uh, Dana Steele, uh, civil engineer with J.R. Russo and Associates. Thank you. If you guys could just give me one second. Is that the generator I'm hearing on? That's the uh, AC. HVC kicked on. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys don't mind speaking up a little bit because we're getting, uh, yeah. Of Thank course. You. Thank um, you very much. Just get closer to the microphone. That'd be fine. Understood. <laughs> Uh, so we're here to present our plan uh, for our campus uh, on 148 Hazard Avenue. Uh, the campus was developed between the 70s uh, through the late 90s, and uh, it's we're, we're beyond capacity for the services we'd like to provide for the town of Enfield. So uh, we have a proposed plan um, for some new buildings, modification of some of the existing buildings uh, to kind of extend our plan. Okay, so thank you, Commissioners. I'd like to just give a quick presentation on Johnson Memorial and the history in, in uh, Enfield for Cam. We can, you want to move through? You want to click through it? Or yeah, go ahead, you can. Uh, yeah, if it works. So a little bit of history. You all probably know Johnson, his, next slide, uh, has been in existence since 1912, but I thought I'd summarize a little bit of what happened in our expansions in Enfield. 1986, we established a sur surgery center. In 1994, the Nirenberg Center was established for the women's and infants at the hospital. We also had the Nirenberg Building, uh, where our wound center is. And then in 1998, the Cancer Center in Enfield. And then the Sleep Center opened in Enfield in 2006. And then the 2011, the Karen Kwisnowick Infusion Center was opened at the Cancer Center and renamed Johnson Memorial Center. And Karen Kwisnowick is Mrs. Blake's uh, daughter, um, as you may know. And then um, Johnson Memorial in 2012 entered into an affiliation with St. Francis Care. And in 2016, we became part of Trinity Health of New England. Just to give a little bit of history, who's Trinity Health? Uh, if we go to the next slide, so Trinity Health is 22 state integrated healthcare system, 95 hospitals and 22, uh, 93 hospitals in 22 states, 120 continuing care programs, nearly 2.5 million home health and hospice. And then on an annual basis, we, um, we contribute about a million billion dollars annually to the community benefit. We have clinically integrated networks, 120,000 colleagues and 5,300 employed physicians and 23,000 uh, affiliated providers. As far as Trinity Health of New England is concerned, I just go to the map. Uh, we, Mercy Medical Center in Springfield was part of um, uh, Trinity Health first. And then uh, St. Francis at Mount Sinai went second in 2015. And Johnson Memorial became part of Trinity Health of New England on, on 2016. And St. Mary's became part of it in 2016. So from Waterbury to Springfield uh, is who Trinity Health of New England is. And just to go to the next slide quick, just to give a, a where's our locations here? If we, so we have obviously the surgery center, excuse me, and then we have the cancer center. We also have card, cardiology and cardiovascular services, diagnostic imaging lab and surgical services at the ambulatory care center. That's the building one that we're gonna be talking about tonight, along with the ex expansion of the cancer center. If we go to the next slide. In this side, we also have the Advanced Wound Center, 
on the same campus where the ambulatory care center is. We also have occupational medicine at 155 Hazard Avenue in that same plaza. We have our sleep center and outpatient rehab and physician services. And just as a quote, you know, from through our partnership with government, industry, and community organizations, we want to make a lasting and positive contribution to the communities in which we work um, by Albert Falk. And that's kind of our mission, it goes along with our mission statement, Trinity Health in New England. So thank you, and thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Um, again, for the record, uh, Dana Steele, I'm a professional engineer with J.R. Russo and Associates. Our office is at One Shoham Road. I'm going to switch slides here to um, go through the, the site plan with you. Pull it up here. So um, <clears throat> here's a, an aerial photo of, uh, of the site. Uh, our architect um, provided this for me. I thought it was a good place to start so you can just get a bird's eye view of uh, what the site uh, looks like. As you're coming in from Hazard Avenue, on your right is the Nirenberg building that was mentioned. And then as you continue through the main uh, driveway, uh, uh, in the back on your right is that cancer center. And in the back, that's 142. So we got 140, 142. Then across the main drive aisle is this two-story building, uh, which is uh, uh, private medical offices. Uh, and um, that's 146. And then 148 is this building in the front. It's a one-story surgery center. And that's uh, the, this, this building is coming down. Uh, there's going to be a new two-story building in its place, and the cancer center is going to have an addition uh, to it. So uh, here's, here's our site plan uh, that we submitted with this application for land use permitting. And um, just uh, want to start off with uh, sheet three of the set where uh, is our boundary survey. And I just want to mention about this. Uh, originally, this site contained six parcels. There were two uh, that fronted on, on Hazard Avenue. And there was four in the back in this uh, residential zone. So we have a, a R44 zone line here, uh, the uh, business park BP zone in the front. Uh, and uh, in two 2016, we submitted a, um, we filed a, a plan, a survey um, showing the entire area as one parcel. So it was our understanding that all, all six parcels were merged into one, but on the assessor's record, they still show them as separate parcels. So mm -hmm. staff pointed that out to us and said, we need to clean that up. So we agree to the condition, whatever needs to be done to, to kind of finalize that and make that uh, uh, clear. That was certainly always the intent. Uh, we believe we've uh, made good strides towards that. Um, that was, and, and so we'll just continue to, to, to clean that up as we go forward. That's one thing done. Uh, you can just see from this plan too, um, the uh, couple of utility lines, there's a gas, a gas line that runs along the eastern boundary uh, and also a water line, Hazardville Water has a service uh, through here and it connects their service on Hazard Ave and Middle Road. So this property is bounded on the, the, the north. Uh, north is facing uh, to your left as you look at the plan. So Hazard Ave on the north side, Middle Road on the south side, and we have uh, other uh, BP zones on either side to the uh, east and the west. It'll sharpen up in a second there. Here's our existing conditions plan uh, for the site, and you already saw the aerial photo, which is a little easier to read than this, but this has all the details of, uh, of the, the existing uh, site. I've talked about the four buildings there, and I just want to uh, move ahead to this plan. That red area that you see in the upper corner, the eastern portion of the site, that's an aquifer protection zone. Um, uh, we, we were aware that we were partially in an aquifer protection zone. Um, I didn't show it on the plan, the location. I didn't have a real good, a real good location. So I sent out notices, and I, I initially thought it was Hazardville Water because we're in Hazardville Water service area. Uh, but just to be safe, I sent it to Connecticut Water both uh, as well. Turns out this is a Connecticut Water aquifer, even though it's a Hazardville Water service area. So uh, the red line is the limits of their aquifer, which is a quite a large aquifer. Yeah. This is for the Powder Hollow uh, 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 public wells down at, down at Powder Hollow. So this is a, a good distance. We're in the very outskirts of that, of, of that aquifer area. But because of that, Connecticut Water submitted a letter uh, to staff with some recommendations for conditions which staff incorporated into their report, and we're in agreement with those. And I can tell you more in detail about how, how we're going to comply with what, what they're asking for as I go through the plans. I just wanted you to see 
where that was in relation to the site so you can understand. It's not the entire site, but it's a portion of the site in the aquifer area. The water company, by the way, did confirm that this use does not require an aquifer permit because we're not, we don't have hazardous materials and that we're not the kind of use that would be of a concern to them, but they still have any development within the aquifer. They, they have recommendations on, on how they'd like to see it developed. All right, there's the aerial photo again, just to refresh your, your memory. And, um, and then on to our uh, demolition plan, just quickly, the, what you see in red there is uh, the proposed buildings. And what I want to just explain to you, you're wondering, how, how is this going to work? We, the last applicant was talking about relocating people. We have so the this, this similar uh, problem here where we have uh, doctors in these, in these buildings that need to continue to service their, their patients. So the way we, uh, the solution we came up with was to put the new building in front of the existing building. Uh, but before we can do that, we need to uh, compensate for the parking that we're losing because that's a parking lot right now. So the first phase of this project is going to be install some additional parking along the eastern uh, boundary. So if we go back to this plan, it's easier for you to see. Some additional parking here in the grass area and then some additional parking in the, in the back here. We're going to construct part of our parking lot that we're building in the back uh, here. And then once that parking is in place, uh, then we can start constructing this, this new building in the front here as well as the, the addition to the cancer center. So, so that's going to provide us with the, the, uh, the offset. If you look at this photo too, it doesn't look like a fully parked site, does it? Um, uh, and, and that's in part because there's vacancies right, right now in, this, in, in, in these buildings. Uh, but uh, the, the, the renovations that they're doing, the improvements in technology, they're expecting to be fully occupied. So. It's not going to be, it's not going to look like that going forward. Uh, so, so again, the phasing plan, uh, so they'll, they'll start building the, um, uh, the buildings. And once this building is completed, they'll move everybody out of the surgery center into the, into the new surgery center and then can start demoing this building and then complete the parking that wraps around between these two buildings, uh, the new building and the existing building re that remains. So, so that's um, really the, the phasing of, of the, the project, just wanted to understand that. Here's another aerial photo showing the two additions, where the two building, the building and the addition, where they fall in relation to the existing uh, improvements on the site. The next plan is the, is the layout plan. This is kind of our main uh, zoning compliance plan that, that we show you. We deal with parking, we deal with setbacks, uh, and, uh, and just the general layout uh, of, the, uh, of the site. So um, uh, we have uh, the new building in the front, the addition to the cancer center, um, and uh, an access road, a perimeter access road a, a, along the east side of the property. Now, one of the issues that came up is uh, in the staff report, they identified that this driveway curb cut out onto Hazard Avenue, which we were proposing, we had initially met with, with uh, um, staff. We had, an, we had two ARTs. This goes back a couple of years. We had our first ART, and then things were on hold. And, and back in January, we had a second ART. And the issue was brought up at that point that your regulations say you can only have one curb cut per lot. And we used to have two lots, but as I said, they've been merged now, so there's a bit of a techni technical problem uh, with that. Um, at the time, uh, we had the impression that we could proceed this way, but now we understand from st after talking with staff that, that they're, not, they're not comfortable saying that that's okay for you to approve with that because of the way the regulation is written. And I said, so what's the solution here? Because we, we think that this curb cut is a good idea. Um, you know, it's... It's, it's going to serve uh, for, for deliveries to be able to come in and access the loading area on the, on the uh, southeast corner of the new building. Uh, it's going to you know, uh, have less truck traffic going through the heart of the, uh, of the site. Um, uh, they're, they're, they still will have to exit the site because this will just be a one way. It's not a left hand turns in, but um, uh, staff has recommended a condition that you approve it without this driveway, and we're okay with that. But what we'd like to do is to continue discussion with staff about a possible text amendment that would allow us to have this curb cut. Um, and, and, we, and we think that it probably was not your intention maybe to, on a large site like this um, for a limited access where it's only for, for, for deliveries that's really just making it better. It's not uh, uh, creating more turning movements out onto Hazard Avenue. So, but. I, I, I won't get into that now because what we're asking you to approve now does not include this. So 
Um, I just wanted to uh, point that out. Before I move on to the next slide, okay. one. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Um, Chairman. A little confused. I don't want to lose the train of thought if I could just interject as a chairman. So you're recommending not to have the curb cut or a modification to it? So um, we're asking you to approve the site plans with the condition that the, that the curb cut is not included. Uh, that's that's what staff's recommended. We're in agreement with that. And so we would then, the, with the intention that we come back with a text amendment yep. so, to make it all copacetic and uh, assume, assuming you uh, ex agree with the text amendment and then, a, and then a, a modification to the plan to put the curb cut back in. And so we thought, the, the part of the reason is um, they're, they're under a tight time schedule here. And, and if we withdraw our application and go through that process first, it's going to delay the start of construction and start to create um, some cha challenges for the applicant. So if you're willing to work with us a little on, on that, we, we'd appreciate it. It would help us uh, keeping on, on schedule. All right. So um, again, uh, just to Re remind you about the aquifer. Here, here's the proposed site plan. That's where it, that's where it falls. You can see some of our parking lot, new parking lot is within that aquifer area. Some of it is not. Uh, most of the site is not, but that's uh, that's the aquifer area once again. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to mention was um, at the ART meetings, uh, we were inquiring about the possibility of having a construction access out to Middle Road. Now, there's residents across the street on Middle Road, and we want to protect those residents. There's already a, a planted buffer there. We're going to be enhancing that buffer to make it better. Um, but um, when we brought up that issue to the fire department, they said, we really want a second access into this site. This is, this is a big site, and we're not, we don't like the fact that there's only one way in and out. And, and the regulations do allow for a break in that buffer for emergency access. And so... Uh, this would be uh, used temporarily for construction uh, to help with uh, ease the congestion of traffic uh, during construction and then converted to emergency only with gates. So it will not be used for any commercial purpose just for the fire department, uh, just for emergency services as they need to get in and out of here. And, it's, and with an ambulatory care center, seems like a good idea to be able to get people there quickly. Um, so, so we thought they, they were really in favor of that. And so we said, let's, let's do it. Um, and then the question is, where do we put it along Middle Road? And I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in a minute. Uh, just briefly here, though, um, staff said, so why don't you give us a plan to show without that curb cut on, out onto Hazard Ave, what is the plan, what's the plan going to look like? So this area that's zigzag hatched here, that's going to be going away. And instead, there's going to be a cut through in the parking lot here. So trucks can come in, make a right-hand turn past the dumpster then back into the loading area, and then pull forward and out and around the site. So um, uh, we, we, we think it can work. We think this is better. Um, and that's why we're going to be coming back with, with a text amendment and modification to, uh, to, to ultimately do this. So just want to be forthright about that, let you know what our plan is, and certainly we'll um, welcome any feedback or comments. All right. So uh, next plan, just quickly, is our, our grading and uh, Utility plan, just note that we have all the appropriate erosion control measures to during construction to make sure that we're not polluting or, or having a, a nuisance or negative impact on, on receiving waters and, and so forth. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, well, I didn't mention, too, just quickly back to here. Up in this uh, eastern portion of the site, see this uh, gray rectangular area here? That's a generator. They're required because it's a hospital. They're required to have a generator service. And so it's quite, it's quite large. Uh, it's gas powered, um, natural gas powered. So it's quiet, right? I assume it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot quieter than a diesel one would be. Um, so we think that that's good. Um, but so that, that's the area for, for that. It's another site feature I wanted you to, to be aware of. Did you wanna say something, Stu? No. Oh, okay. All right, so just wanted to show you briefly that th this is where our emergency access will come out. You see, we picked a spot where the, we, we, if we had it further to the, uh, to the west, we'd be right in front of a house. Yep. If we put it all the way to the east, we'd be in front of a house. This is, this is a, that's a residential property, but there's a, a nice uh, arborvitae screen there. And so of all the places that we could come out, this seemed like uh, the ideal place uh, to do it. So satisfying the fire department, what they're looking for, without having a significant impact on, on the neighbors. So we hope that uh, that, that will... Um, uh, be acceptable. Um, there's our, our utility plan, and just um, I want to spend 
I don't want to bore you with all the details of the of the utility plan, but but obviously this is the nuts and bolts of what I do. Um, the uh, um, storm drainage system includes a subsurface uh, detention system under the parking lot to account for the increase in impervious surface. Everything in the site drains to a, a stormwater basin in the front of the site. You've probably seen it. Uh, we're going to be enhancing that, digging it deeper so we can ha actually have a pond there, a permanent pool. And we're going to put a fountain in it, uh, light up the fountain so it'll be a, a nice feature for the site. I think we'll, we'll en enhance it. It'll also help with, with water quality and avoid algae buildup in, 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 in that pond. So it'll be, it'll be nice looking. Our, our landscape <coughs> architect can tell you more about how, how we're going to improve it aesthetically. All right, um, last thing, I guess, uh, uh, second to last I wanna mention is the, the lighting plan. We provided a photometric plan. Uh, there is there's existing lighting on the site. We're gonna be replacing all of it uh, uh, and uh, putting in uh, new poles, new LED lights, uh, full cutoff fixtures. Uh, the, if, you, if I zoomed in here, you could see these numbers are all zero around the, around the perimeter here. There'll be no light trespass off the property, no impact on the residential properties in, in, in the back. There are some uh, light poles in this uh, residential portion here. They're already existing. We're not they're not new. We're not proposing them. We're just replacing them. Uh, and your regulations require a maximum height of 14 feet, so they have to be lower in the residential zone, and so we're complying with that. So, so that's, uh, um, I think, the, uh, the lighting plan. Boy, I've just been kind of doing this uh, off the top of my head rather than following my notes here, but I think I've You're done, doing a good job. I think I've done pretty well. <laughs> I think I've covered everything I need to. I don't want to take too much of your time, and I do want our landscape architect to have an opportunity to come up and tell you a little about landscape. And before I call her up, though, any questions for me about the site design? You want me to go into any more details? We probably about will. Why don't we get the landscape, and then we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Okay. Keep going with your presentation. All right. You want to come up, Terry? Is this on now? Okay. Terry Hahn, um, uh, professional landscape architect, LAD APC, Simsbury, Connecticut. How are you guys doing today? All right. So as you know, the site itself is an uh, interesting combination of sort of open grass and um, some uh, existing trees. Uh, so the, one of the um, uh, nicer features are the existing crab apples along um, uh, Hazard Ave. Those will stay. Uh, and we've tried to save as many of those as possible. I believe there is one uh, that we need to take out uh, where the um, new circular drive is going to be. But we tried to save as many of those as possible. Um, what we did do, though, is uh, at some point, obviously, the regulations change. So we have to put shade trees and appropriate trees within the parking. So those have all been added uh, to the all through this area uh, for the new parking lot so that you'll feel it'll have a totally different feel than what the parking lots have right now. <laughs> so um, it's a combination of, uh, you know, various different native trees. Um, the one interesting part was in accordance with the Connecticut Water Company uh, talking about adding a bioswale in uh, within this area here. We have a couple of um, appropriate trees, uh, some willows and some red maples that can handle having a little bit more water on their feet uh, so that we can accommodate that. Um, the, obviously, the area of importance is at the front of the building uh, for both um, the new um, uh, hospital area and the cancer care, and that's a quite a bit detailed combination of uh, perennials and um, it's, you know, herba herbaceous plants and some shrubs. Uh, it's a little bit of... Um, more uh, work for the um, Trinity Health than what they're currently putting into the, the area, um, but they have agreed that that's part of sort of the overall image that they're trying to um, uh, get into the site that's consistent with what the building looks like. So it's, it's a slightly different, more active approach uh, to the overall planting. There is extensive planting, habitat planting, associated with the stormwater basin. 
right now, the stormwater basin, unfortunately, um, is pretty much just Phragmites. And so in the process of um, digging that out, putting the pool in, also refresh the surface, get some of those Phragmites out of there, put a more appropriate uh, wetland um, uh, retention basin planting uh, just in the area that's going to get inundated regularly. And then on the outside edge, we have a whole series of habitat plantings, um, things that are native, but also a little bit colorful. And there's a sort of a seasonal pattern of flowers that occur throughout that area uh, so that we're able to sort of add a little bit better interest at the front entry uh, to the overall site itself. Um, I think uh, we did add uh, at staff request, um, there's planting. So the buffer over uh, for Middle Road, been there for a while. Bottom branches are starting to disappear. Uh, so you have a little bit of view where you didn't have one 20 years ago. So what we're adding uh, is a series of shrubs. Um, it's uh, large rhododendrons, um, uh, um, bayberry that hold their leaves and get a good solid 10, 12 feet if you just leave them alone. And they'll just make a nice big bush that'll cover that view because I can't get those plants back. I can't get those branches back. So um, this way that'll help. Uh, they did ask uh, for some additional planting, um, put in some spruce trees at the curve so that if for some reason you're standing here, you don't have a view straight in. So that was one of the staff requests. I think that's any other questions? Oh, great. Thank you. Might, there might be some, but okay. thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Terry. Um, so we're going to switch uh, now to the building plans. I'm going to ask Doug uh, Main from SLAM to come up and, and uh, run through that for us. Let's see. Want to click yourself and sit down? Yeah, Is that the best way? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Doug Main from the SLAM Collaborative, and I'm the lead design architect with the firm, uh, 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 one of the partners in the firm behind me, Steve Doherty, uh, be available for questions as well. And, you know, we've been involved with the project. I mean, our role in the project was all the way back, you know, day one, to early concepts through programming and planning and into design and, you know, getting, you know hopefully getting into construction <laughs> very soon is is uh, our role will continue on that. And with the, uh, you know, Dana's you know, giving you the rundown on, on the site, which uh, will save me a little bit of time. We, you know, we, we know what the footprints are all about. And what's gonna happen uh, now after I get past this, this uh, diagram of the site is I'm gonna rotate the building floor plans uh, just so they fit on the sheet better. And so north rather than being to the left is gonna be to the, is gonna be to the top on, on the page is a little more customary, but hopefully we're not going to make you dizzy by doing that. So this uh, first building, what we want to do first is just run through the basic floor plans for the, the two different uh, uh, projects on, on the campus. First one being the ambulatory care building, which is the freestanding two-story building uh, right along Hazard. Hazard Ave will be just off the page uh, above uh, the footprint that you see here in, in, the, in the color floor plan. So the first floor of the ambulatory care center I'm just going to kind of walk through it as a patient or family member uh, might might do so, just to get you oriented to what's going on. Uh, the the front door to the facility, again for patients and family, would be down in this lower uh, left corner. The square basically uh, basically here identifies the, the lobby for the for the building, if you will, and that will not only be the entrance for the first floor patrons, but also will be uh, associated with the entrance, getting you up to the second floor by means of the elevator uh, at the front of the building and, and a stair. Uh, running along the south of the building is an array of reception and, and waiting uh, for this first floor, which serve uh, a set of uh, clinical exam modules, which are supported by the various practices with, within the building, represented in the couple of green tones that you see here, and then bookended at the top by the staff support areas, kind of a large open work area, conference space, uh, lounge lockers, things like that. And that basically basically gets us through the first two thirds of the overall footprint. As we come farther to the right into the blue area, this is the uh, imaging 
uh, area of the of the first floor plan, which has an array of imaging services, which you know, there's kind of one of everything at the moment. We have a women's center, uh, uh, a nuclear med area, CT scan, rad rooms, things like that are, are, are happening in, in that blue area, also served by that same uh, basic waiting area. As we go further to the right, I'm going to go down to the very lower portion. This is that uh, kind of delivery area that Dana was talking about again rotated uh, versus the, the site plan you saw earlier it's also a staff entrance back here which does the same thing basically that the front does for the for the for the patients it, it provides access not only uh, for staff not only to the first floor but up by way of stairs and an elevator to the second floor as well uh, and gray a little bit of uh, mechanical space kind of the top the top things off uh, this is the second floor of the ambulatory care center Going back to that lower left corner, you see that same square again, and that's just to create a, a very clear identity of you know, lobby and entry and waiting functions consistent on both floors, just to keep uh, wayfinding and, and navigating the building easier for everyone. We have a, the same swath of waiting here, a little smaller. It's not quite as much uh, <coughs> patients and family associated with this floor as we do uh, have uh, uh, relative to the traffic downstairs. And this, this entire floor is dedicated to the ambulatory surgery function, which is replacing the building that this new building is be, being built in front of, uh, but you know, right-sized and large and enhanced with some new services that that existing building can't, can't accommodate right now. And off onto the upper or to the left portion in the, you know, don't, denoted by the, the green colors, that's kind of the, the uh, prep and recovery area uh, uh, for the folks uh, coming in for their procedure or surgery. And as you uh, come into the next half of the footprint where the red tones are, that's basically the, the surgery, endoscopy, and, and whatnot functions happening back there. You know, the large spaces you see here are the actual ORs, some of the support functions behind the ORs you see here, and then uh, kind of bookended on this far right with some of the staff support areas, lockers and lounge rooms and some offices, things like that. Uh, rooftop of that building, <clears throat> there is a small area up top for mechanical penthouse space uh, connected by that back stair that we had uh, shown on the first couple of levels. And now switching over to the, the existing cancer center, this is a plan of the existing cancer center uh, showing uh, the the existing in, in the green uh, uh, in, infusion portion of that cancer center and also in the kind of the hatched area, which is out of bounds for our project, is the, the radiation oncology function, uh, which we are kind of leaving intact uh, for, for, for this project. And switching to the new plan, you can see it's almost just by, by making the, the spaces the, the proper size they need to be by modern standards, uh, the entirety of the infusion uh, bays that the, that the patients use are, are being placed into the new footprint that we're adding to the building. And, and if you can sort of see the, the ghost of the old rectangle of the existing, that's all being renovated to provide uh, new exam space, uh, staff areas, and things like that in a, in a, in a, in a manner that's going to be uh, better able to serve the, the functions here. If I may ask very quickly, is, is the, um, lack of a better term, the chemo mixing lab room changing there, where they actually put together the um, minimal modifications, yeah, ju uh, just changing the door entry, but okay. the, the shell of it. It's, so that, that, it's new and modern and meets yeah. 800 standards. Yeah, it was done a couple of years ago, so that's staying. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that, that's represented by this gray area down yeah. here. Yep. And okay. this is the new entrance that, that Tony's uh, mentioning here. Yep, okay, thank you. Uh, and then there's, there's an existing small uh, second floor here, uh, which is uh, going to Going to be an improved version of some of the staff functions that we're we're, uh, we're looking to have on, on the at this new building or at the uh, this renovated building. And so then uh, we wanted to touch on and, and give you some of the highlights of the uh, the architectural exterior approach uh, to the project. And we've you know as Dana mentioned we've we've presented to the ART a few times now over the you know with the hiccups of the pandemic and whatnot uh, the, the project. And as we've gotten you know closer to pulling the trigger on this, we've you know zeroed in you know on what the material palette will be for this. And this this uh, uh, set of images here is just a, a abstract representation of the materials that we're proposing for the project. You'll see um, uh, uh, some cast stone, a stone veneer, and a, a different uh, type of a cast stone. 
uh, in these upper panels here, which represents the bulk of the exterior envelope for the project. It's, it's essentially a masonry building. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we had a kind of a scenic route to get in there, but that's how we ended up uh, proceeding with the project. Uh, and it's going to be uh, a good way to, to, to really uh, create the aesthetic that the, the, the client's looking for and create a building that's going to be, you know, uh, you know long-lasting and, and good-looking for a number of years. Uh, mixed in with, with some of the masonry will be a couple accent materials you'll see in the images, uh, the primary one being a, a, a wood plank uh, material that will be used to help soften the masonry a little bit and just give it a little bit more visual interest. And then there's a, a, a kind of a medium gray aluminum color that you'll see you know, with the windows and with some infill panels and things like that uh, around the, uh, the perimeter of the, of the building. So I'm going to start with the ambulatory care center again. And here you can begin to see the deployment of those materials. Uh, this is the, you know, the important corner of the campus and of the ambulatory care building. And so we wanted to have uh, a good amount of architectural intensity at this corner and punctuated by uh, the entry itself as one gets closer as a pedestrian or, or performing a drop off to the glass uh, corner here, helping to denote the actual entry to the building versus a, a quieter architecture that tapers off to the other end, which we don't want to call attention to. Um, so this this uh, corner here is uh, pretty much a mix of all the materials I think we just presented. The upper portion is the is the light colored cast stone that we have on that uh, first pallet, uh, kind of down below and and creating a, a base for the bulk of the building perimeter is a um, uh, ashlar stone veneer uh, that will wrap, wrap around most of the uh, the perimeter except where we have some uh, wood, uh, wood plank accents to help, again, just create a more interesting uh, visual appeal uh, to that corner in particular. And, uh, and then we have the, the glass corner here, which will show, and this is more of an eye level view here, uh, just as you would turn onto the main boulevard entry into the campus. And you can begin to see how, despite, despite the view, good amount of mechanical needs for this building and we we have a, a screen you'll notice here a little more easily get down at eye level and and most of the the uh, intricacies of that rooftop are going to kind of go away and, and be uh, concealed by that by that roof screen this is a good image showing that and then proceeding deeper into the site again going up and overhead again this is a, a better shot at what that glass corner is doing in terms of creating the calling card for the for the building and creating a very uh, 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 very easy to find uh, entry point, uh, whether you're performing a drop off, we have a drop off canopy here, or if you're just walking in from, uh, from, the, from the parking, you'd all filter in, all the patients and family would filter into the same entry point. And you can see uh, some uh, more variety of that masonry exterior we have. We have a kind of a dark upper for, for parts of the building that we want to have just kind of drop off or help to, uh, to uh, kind of trim down the, the bulk of this, uh, the massing on this, on this building versus the light, which we're trying to call attention to. So it depends on where we're deploying those materials in terms of what we're trying to do architecturally, tries to conform to that. And uh, getting down at eye level here, this is um, kind of a good eye level view of the entry. You can see a little bit more detail on, on the canopy, the glass corner, and then you can see the, the, the masonry materials as they kind of taper away and uh, radiate away from that, from that entry point. And then the Existing cancer center, you know, we're not we're not really from an exterior standpoint not doing much, if anything. You know, we have a few uh, minor incursions uh, exterior-wise into this building, but we have had the renovation down below. But the bulk of the the architectural effort is with the new addition. Uh, the new addition we wanted to have uh, take on the characteristics of the new architecture we're introducing here, um, but we didn't want it to uh, thumb its nose at the existing. So here we have the existing. And next slide will show how the, the new architecture docks into it. And just with a, with a few simple things, like just trying to have a common base height uh, telegraph through into the new project, having a small brow that mimics the, the eave overhang uh, of the existing. You know, those things will you know, make an obvious connection, but it, it also uh, will be a way to kind of springboard into the new architectural palette and just create that new, that new brand that we want to see uh, develop on this site. And then uh, another more eye level view down here. You can sort of see how they kind of communicate with each other. And uh, you can see that introduction of that new architecture down at eye level. And that's it for the you know, basic plans and, and uh, 
exterior for the for the new buildings. Any questions on those? We probably will be. I wouldn't go away. <laughs> um, are, are, you, is your, are you done with your basic presentation at this point? Yeah, I just wanted to summarize uh, again, Dana Steele, for the record, um, uh, a couple of things uh, that, that I missed from my my presentation. Parking. Yeah. You mentioned your the parking yep. requirements. The regulations require for these medical offices. Um, uh, over 400 parking spaces for this site. Right now, there's 317. And you can see from the aerial photos, they've kind of got more than enough right now. But with this expansion, they're going to uh, need additional spaces. We're proposing 45 additional sp spaces, bringing, up, bringing us up to 362. Now, your regulations allow you to modify your parking requirements uh, based on uh, 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 published data, um, and so we sub we submitted some of that. The, the Institute of Traffic Engineers uh, says for these type of uses, the the average um, uh, is a, a little lower, so only uh, uh, 318 spaces would be required if you use the average. But if you look at the at that at the spread of all that they they t they look at all the different sites across the country, and and they and and they got some some much higher, some lower. That's what the average is. We're going to um, uh, be in the uh, in, in between what your regulations say, 404, and and what the, what the the average is. And we think that the 362 is 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 what is what we need for for, for this site. So we'd like to um, uh, request that you approve it uh, with the the, the 362. Um, the uh, um, just uh, also quickly. Um, I mentioned the aquifer uh, recommendations. Uh, if you'd like, I can go into more detail about how I'm going to address that. Uh, but if um, there is a condition that uh, covers it, and I've already talked with with your town engineer about it, and, and making sure that we're um, it's mostly has to do with storm drainage. That's that that's they're concerned about water quality and water quantity. They don't want to lose water from their aquifer, and but they want it to be clean. So. Uh, and that's uh, uh, what, what we're going to uh, uh, provide for them so that they're, they're satisfied with that. And we've really kind of already worked that out, but be happy to go into more detail if, uh, if you'd like. So I guess just in, in conclusion, uh, we've, we're very excited about this project. We think that it's great to bring uh, um, an, an ambulatory care center to, uh, to, to Enfield. Uh, and we think that this, although this is not a huge expansion of the site, um, it's going to be a dramatic increase, a dramatic improvement to this site. Uh, I think you're really going to be impressed with it and pleased with it when, when it's done. Based on what I'm seeing uh, from my experience looking at this, I think this is going to be a really good project. So um, we'd, we'd appreciate it if you would consider approving this tonight with, with conditions uh, that we're in agreement with the staff's recommend, recommended conditions. And so um, thank you for your time. Thank you. So now, now we'll start our questions. So don't go far. Okay. Um, I'm looking around. Who, who would like? I, as usual, I've got my highlights here. You guys know my routine, but I, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> but who would like to start first, Commissioner DeGray? Go ahead. Um, I did notice because you did answer most of my questions in your presentation. Because my concern was this second driveway and the aquifer protection. Um, about the traffic flow, and it's a, and these are in the um, ART uh, notes, the do not enter sign at the traffic circle so that people just don't drive over and get into an accident, and a stop sign when they're exiting out through there. Um, I'm just curious if it wasn't on the plan, so I just want to make sure that those two things are addressed. Um, yeah, so um, the, I think police uh, mentioned that they, there should be a do not enter sign uh, yeah. here so that as you're coming to, the, to a stop here, as a crosswalk a here, that you don't make a left-hand turn and go the wrong direction trying to drop off. So yeah. generally, you would want the drop off to be on the passenger side. Uh, uh, and so we've got that circulation going counterclockwise around that island. So we'll, um, we're going to, uh, that's one of the conditions of approval that we add in those signs. Okay. So, yeah, they'll, they'll, they will be right. added in. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mr. Holinsky? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions. One, mm -hmm. one is that uh, I noticed you're expanding your OR space and all that. Would you be now including higher level procedures than are normally done in the facility today 
So, so yeah. d there would be more complex Sorry. procedures uh, being performed with the new facility? Yeah, so um, currently the, the ORs are, are significantly below FGI standards, almost half of the square footage. Sure. Um, so with modern procedures, uh, you know, we run out of space for humans and equipment. Sure. Um, so these ORs being FGI and larger, um, it'll certainly expand our palette for specialists to do uh, ambulatory access work. And if uh, you look at healthcare today, um, more insurance companies are encourage people to go to ambulatory access centers instead of going into the hospital if not necessary. Um, so you see those scope of work being larger, and that's uh, that that's pr the primary reason for, for our expansion. So as an example, I mean, I know you do endoscopies and colonoscopies and all that kind of stuff there, but then would you be expanding into, like, putting in stints? Um, kind of pro so probably limited cardiac, um, but certainly orthopedics, um, urology, uh, I mean, tons of eye stuff, hands, uh, yeah. In, in our currently, we do colonoscopies and endoscopies in an OR, which is uh, kind of a, a waste of space as far as our, our concern is. So this new building would have speci specified uh, endo and colonoscopy space and four ORs. So not only can we do what we do now, plus more services, but of a greater volume of services, larger recovery areas and preoperative areas. It's also, also going to attract surgeons that we don't have now to come into the That's more modern time, yeah. facility <laughs> and, and be able to have the technology that they're looking for in, a, in an ambulatory setting. So Okay, great. I mean, I, mean th I think from that standpoint, it's, it's a good plan to, to expand that facility, and it's convenient to Enfield, people in Enfield. Um, my second uh, question is, have you considered any viable alternatives to the central second entrance off of 190? Um, for example, expanding the road through the middle of the facility and, you know, making it go around the back or something so that you would not have to have the extra entrance. Um, I drive that road every day, and it's, a, you know, there's a lot of traffic on that road. And there, there are a lot of delays with the various lights that are there now. Um, and, and there are also several... Uh, access roads that don't have lights and people it takes forever to get out of those you know? yeah so uh, it, so it, it really <clears throat> would I think it would really exacerbate the the traffic issue even though I've looked through the traffic study and frankly <laughs> it's pretty complex and I, I didn't understand the whole thing but I think the conclusion was that it really isn't going to change all that much you know, yeah, it's not. It's yeah, not. A, I'm not uh, sure. I agree with that. <laughs> it, it's it's really not that big of an increase. It's mostly just replacing and improving and and making it more efficient. I mean, it, it, there's 317 parking spaces now. If you think about it just simply, we're adding 45. So it, it's in terms of that. In terms of trips, it was uh, 40, 50 uh, trips in the peak hour, some, so, something like that. So um, this slide that I'm showing now is is the alternate proposal. Uh, so. If we come back and you say we don't want this other curb cut, then uh, we'll, we'll have to live with this configuration, which, which can work, uh, but we think is, uh, is, is, is not as ideal. Let me just talk a, a minute about, the, about that access since, since you, you brought it up. So if, if you're traveling eastbound toward, towards the site, you're coming up to a signalized intersection. Um, this this curb cut is nearly not going to be used because you're going to pull into the signalized light. You're going to the light. If, if the only time you would use it would be as if you were not paying attention and you drove past the site, well then you could still pull pull into the site. Well, if it wasn't there, what would you do? You'd end up having to pull into some other driveway and turn around and come back. So it actually it provides a, a a safety enhancement. I think um, uh, if if you're coming from uh, the west. You're coming in. You, some people might be tempted to illegally try to make a left-hand turn there. We'll have signs indicating they can't do that. We know not everybody listen, follows signs. We know that, um, but um, the uh, uh, most people do, uh, um, and and they're going to, and and even if they don't, what what will happen here is they they make a left-hand turn in. They're going to come in. They're going to find they have to drive all the way around the site, all the way to the back. Uh, uh, before they come around to a parking lot and then get back up to a building, they're going to find they spent more time going that way. It, it's not a shortcut. Uh, and so it's really just providing uh, an efficient way to get 
trucks from having to go through the, the center of the site uh, and emergency vehicles to better access. And the fire department was was definitely in favor of this additional curb cut. They they thought it was a great idea. Um, they were going to uh, uh, support it. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I, you know, it's not. We're not asking you to approve that tonight. Uh, but I understand um, that. I, I just I, I would encourage you to to look at an alternative. We, we've done this other places in town, and, and in fact, specifically, there's there's an entrance to Big Y, which is just on the street from your facility. Where there's a side, there's an exit, exit and entrance onto uh, Route 190. There's an and entrance. And it's restricted. Only, yeah. You're not supposed going going uh, um, east. You're not supposed to make a left turn. Correct. At least once a day, I see someone make that yeah, left turn. Yeah. And vice versa, coming out, you're supposed to make a right turn and go west. Right. But at least once a day, I see somebody come out of there and go the other way. So, and it's it's a hazardous condition. I, I'm concerned that we would be you know, increase the number of accidents. Yeah. I mean, I mean, signage is fine, but a lot of people don't listen. I, I think I, I agree with you. I think that in Big Y's case, um, it, it is an actually a convenient way to get into the site. So mm -hmm. so there is sort of an incentive there maybe to, uh, to to not follow the rules. In our case, it's really not going to be. It's not going to be incentivized because of the configuration. Uh, People are going to do it once and then realize, why, why did I do this? I could have just gone down to the light and, got, and gotten to where I want to go quicker. So I think that will, would, would, will help to minimize uh, those, those, those concerns. Another example of something like this is over at the, the Home Depot Plaza. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a ride-in only access off of Elm Street, uh, and, uh, and I think that seems to work pretty well. I, I don't see people using it too, too often. Yeah, the, the yeah, no, I understand. I just well, yours is, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. It wasn't on. Thank you. I was coughing before. Um, basically, I mean, uh, yours, I, I take it if somewhere down the line we were to approve this, is more for deliveries instead Correct. of automobiles. It's yeah. more for and, and it's right only. So the, the um, Volkswagen uh, and the um, five guys, that's a right in and right out. Right, so right. So that's a much more complicated right. scenario. Right. That's not what, what we're showing here. This is entrance only. Only right in. Yeah. But again, that's, if you don't, if you don't mind, Commissioner Lisky, if we move on beyond that, this part. Oh, I know. Yeah, no, this is for, this is for just, going just, forward to, uh, some other time, possibly. Sure. Can, any other questions? No, I'm good. Okay. Who was first? Doesn't matter. Uh, Petronella. With with respect to the uh, um, the lock configurations and so forth, uh, so the way I understand it is is it's it's merged. The assumption is that it's merged as one because it's all owned by one entity. However, the zone change will not be affected the zone line will still remain zone there line will not change right so so that that r44 will still remain r44 yes middle road okay very good yeah, yeah we're not this is not a zone change application yeah and uh with with respect to the uh um uh emergency access road um yeah i i agree i think it's a good idea uh, i'm a little bit on the fence about using it for construction access only I'm just considering the impact to the middle road residents of, of in and out. I'm sure that all the traffic will probably not be coming in from there, but a portion of it will be. Or, or, or is it your intent to restrict construction traffic 100% to middle road? I, I don't think it's intent to restrict it uh, to, to, to middle road. Um, no, it, it'll be more convenient when we're doing the bulk of the construction on the building that's up against 190 to bring construction traffic through the main entrance. Mm -hmm. It's just just as an alternative in mostly when we're doing that phasing, like the back work on the back yeah. parking lot and stuff and bringing in, yeah. um, you know, some of the site lay down stuff. It'll it'll be very minimal. OK. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Lionel. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to dovetail off uh, some of the traffic questions um, that Mr. Herlinski was talking about. So if that other road is not put in, do you have your proper radiuses at that current entrance for trucks and other bigger vehicles? Oh, yeah. Anticipating yeah, there? Yeah, it's actually bigger. Um, that that, that um, the, 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 main, the main entrance is, is wider and has even bigger radiuses. We tried to 
have a, a minimal presence on, on Middle Road, recognizing it's a residential uh, area. No, I'm talking about the second access, not Middle Road. Oh, you're talking yeah. about So you're the, talking about the current yeah. main entrance. Your, your future delivery road, if that's not approved on your main entrance now, is that going to be able to handle yes. all your turning radiuses for your trucks your, and your passenger vehicles and sight lines and, and, and all that? Yeah. And so, and I see you had a traffic study done. So when was that study done? How old is it? Uh, it was done this year. Okay. And no increase in peak traffic? Uh, there is uh, in, an increase. Uh, I think it was uh, 40 to 60 trips per mm -hmm. in, in the peak hour. So, okay. there, you know, there, there, is some, there is some increase, but no change in level of service was the main thing. So they, they look at how, um, level of service means you're, you're at the light. How long do you have to wait? Right. So, so um, it, it may have increased by a few seconds, the mm -hmm. amount of time you have to wait during the peak hour, mm -hmm. but not to kick it up to, the, to a, a level of service D. Uh, so it's it's still uh, C. It's considered it's considered to be no change okay. uh, in in the function of that intersection. Okay, and I see you're going to be talking with the state for improvements on the curb cut or. This is uh, because of the the size of the building, the number of parking spaces. It's a, considered a major traffic generator. It mm -hmm. requires an OSTA permit, and so we've already uh, submitted that application. Uh, we're waiting response, mm -hmm. but that is uh, something that takes place after the local approvals. Right. We work those out. Um, yep. And. It, they, they could require uh, Im improvements to the to, to Hazard Avenue, what, you know, turning lanes or thing. But there's already turning lanes there, um, and so we, we don't believe that there's going to be any issue or they're going to require anything. But well, you know, and I I do, and I always had a little bit of a problem with that intersection lately. It's been a little crazy. I don't know if it's the light timing, and I know that doesn't come under us. It's off site, um, so I hope the state does engage with you, um, you know, very carefully to, to make sure that. That traffic gets moving because lately it's been a nightmare and i'm not sure if it's the light timing or a state issue but um if there's any improvements uh, i'll be happy um ho hopefully it doesn't make you uh go into your pocket too much for some improvements but um yeah. as long as it's safe because I, I like commissioner linsky was saying there's a lot of traffic in that area I and um so understand yeah and like i said i know it's not our preview to uh, discuss off-site stuff but i'm glad you're uh, engaged with the state and Hopefully everything will work out. We're going to do whatever they tell us to do. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> That's why we don't have to worry about it. But yeah. <laughs> hopefully it'll make some improvements. And uh, other than that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Commissioner Marjorie, do you have questions? No. Like, do you have one, Chris? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't want to drain the access point issue, but um, going to Commissioner Holinsky's point, about alternatives, our, our regulations do encourage shared uh, access uh, points. So, I mean, I'm not sure how, how your neighbor does have two curb cuts <laughs> um, at, at 150 Hazard Avenue. Yeah. Has there, had, had there been any consideration to share one of theirs? Um, would that even be helpful? So, um, and, and, it, and it's I, just I, to I the doubt top of they this. would be interested in, in that, but um, just. Uh, this is the the, the grading uh, plan, and I could I could try to zoom in here and see if I can do that. The the problem is 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 the topography. Um, our our access drive coming in here is, is up at uh, elevation 136, and this site down here is at elevation 133. So we're up three feet above the the uh, the, the the grade there, and so. Um, it, it would uh, uh, pre present uh, cha uh, challenges. Plus, they've got parking all along here. So if we were to have some connection through, they'd lose parking. And I, I, don't, I don't think that they're going to want that they're going to be open to that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think they're going to be open to that um, uh, type of um, uh, solution. So no, no, we haven't reached out to them, I, I don't there, believe. There's it's, a significant swale there currently. There was actually a footbridge there when I first took over the property. So. Yeah. yeah. yeah You're the, right. The, the water runs down the, the, uh, the pavement that. here and then goes into our stormwater basin. So, so their site drains into our site, and uh, that's why we're providing this culvert to let that water continue to flow where it needs to go. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I think it would be – Difficult, and we would have no control over that, um, uh, really. Um, 
But yeah, not 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 to beat up the issue, but if you if you look in that short section, I mean, there's certainly precedents for double curb cuts and uh, you know much larger curb cuts than we're asking for in the limited access. That we're you know that we're not advertising this as an entrance to the facility. It's it's literally just like a limited access <coughs> to make things more convenient as you know the as we develop this site, you know, future building, uh, you know, future uses, you know, we, to have access for a box truck that doesn't have to wait for patients to walk from their doctor's office over for, to, for surgery, things like that. You know, it's, I think it's, more, it's better for the whole community and people that are using the site. Um, so just to confirm what we'd be approving tonight, is, would it just be uh, unimproved ground cover um, if you were to uh, yes, not correct. do the curb cut? Yeah, it would be all on. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Well, I guess I'll start, and I have a few things. I just want to kind of wrap up to see if we're all on the same page so we can move forward. Thanks. Um, After that, I have a couple. Oh, then go ahead. You go for me. No, no, you go before me, please. I, Chairman, please, Mr. Uh, in reference to the service drive, there are several options. One is a text change. Another is uh, approved without, well, at this point, without it being there, so that's fine too. You'll have enough time between here to DOT and back again, so I'm sure you have considered all that. How about the two merge lots into resubdividing? Is that also an option that to unmerge them? the time limit? To, to unmerge the lots, is that what you're asking? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying give me an answer. It's, it's uh, I, I think the concern with staff, and you can uh, confirm this, the concern that, that with uh, a lot line, you have issues with setbacks and, and oh, that going over the, over the line. So the whole intention was always to merge them all. Okay. I, I okay. think that's the right way to do it. So okay. yeah, I mean, if we want to get creative, uh, <laughs> there's probably other ways we could get there, but okay. I think okay. what staff has proposed is a logical. All right. So as long as you have time between coming back from DOT and doing your thing, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Appreciate that. Okay, I want to go back to this island and not the signage. Uh, your canopy to the new building entrance is about two to three times smaller than the two canopies that exist, one on the entrance canopy on the first building on the right-hand side, labeled 140, and the back building 142. So I'm assuming a smaller canopy and therefore less or smaller number of vehicles coming in is per current requirement of the healthcare industry, okay? Now, as you are coming in, you're going around that island taking a U-turn to go to that small canopy. I'm sure you put your turning radius on ambulance-type vehicles to many others, and you found that to be okay. Oh, yeah. And it's it's an kind of very won't have tight. A problem. Uh, the, um, Taking a due it's, turn. It's, it's a little tight for a, um, a, a large truck, but um, you know, like a, a box truck, but that's not where deliveries are coming. So, Number two, I've been associated with the Woodland Street St. Francis campus since early 1970s and over here, too. One or two cars or vehicles that back up at the canopy really impact your right turning exiting traffic. That has to navigate a right turn very tight with a couple of cars backed up at the canopy entrance and then taking another left turn and then quick right turn for an exit to the traffic light. I'm sure you looked at it carefully. I'm just expressing Maybe you want to look at it one more time. To me, it sounds very tight, taking a right, taking a left, and then there are one or two vehicles already parked at that new canopy. Well, it's, it's wide enough where you can get by. So if a car is parked along there, other cars can, can pass on, on the left. So if it's congested, they can, they can, uh, they can go around, park, and, or wait. 
I, I don't know. Do you want Tony? Is, yeah, are you I, expecting I, to have like a this is a Dunkin' Donuts? No, yeah. So uh, so there's there's a, a a couple of things that act in our favor. So the the style of the medical office building that's occupying the first floor. Um, it's the the reason why we don't have a large waiting room is because the way that healthcare is designed now is there is no waiting. You show up for your doctor's appointment, the doctor brings you in, you're seen, and then you exit. So we see a lot less of that loafing around, waiting at the front door for um, people to come out. How surgery is done now, when you have your surgery done, the nurses would be calling your loved one to at, and queuing them to the time to be at the front door. So we're seeing that traffic uh, reduced a lot. Uh, if you look at, you know, he brought up the St. Francis campus, they're operating without a parking garage at all right now, in, 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 you know, which is a huge ask, but they're, they're dealing with that traffic in the same way, where it's more of that on-time service, in, in which is appreciated by the patients, but also in our traffic pattern. In kind of, I'm sure if we looked at it more, the consideration was there, but there are, there's two existing buildings on the site that kind of impact that traffic flow. And so for future development, you know, those are both older buildings, maybe future development, when those possibly go away, we can come up with a better traffic pattern for more holding. Is this expressing something yeah. oh, you may want to look at again? Yeah, you know, I just wanted you to know we do think about that stuff. <laughs> One more item. There is a demolition plan, sheet number five, yeah. where you show the existing building, 148, and the new building, 148. Somewhere there is a narrative that says the existing building will remain while the new is under construction. Correct. Yeah, that's part of the... Five, sorry. I'm flipping around here trying to find. It. So here, here's the uh, demolition plan. So th there's a construction narrative on the left here, um, see in the upper left corner, where I go through a narrative describing the order that things are going to be done. Uh, so th we're, we're not, you're not going to have two buildings both operating at the at the same time. This is my a concern different. is actually, actually construction sequence, and it goes right. more to construction cost. You are constrained by wetlands on. Hazard Avenue side, yeah. you're constrained by existing driveway on this side, west side, and an existing building on the side side, which is within 20 feet or less. I'm sure there are builders who can do all this work without blinking an eye. So I'm sure it would be easy for such a builder at some kind of a premium cost. <laughs> You may want to reconsider what to do with that existing building and its services while you're building the new one in the front. Again, it's just a concern. I'm not suggesting anything, but that's what goes through my mind. How am I going to build this? I'm within 20 feet of an operating existing facility, and I need a crane to get a steel beam up there, and there are so many other things that are in the way. Traffic. Last thing, promise. During construction, given this kind of constraints, is there an impact on the traffic during construction? Your traffic report addresses before and after, in between. I think you may want to look at it. There's enough room here, I grant that. But I think there needs to be some statement, some narrative about what the traffic would look like while it may be about one or two year time period. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have my mic off. I, I'm just going to go through this thing, trying to wrap up some of the things I saw from staff report and some of the information you gave to us so we can kind of get this moving along here. Thank you. Um, one of the things we already talked about is um, you've, you agree for us to put a stipulation in that you work at the assessor's office to solve that issue. So that should be one of the things I think we should be putting in there as a condition if we are so favorable to approve. Um, are you taking notes, Mr. Secretary? I think, I think it's already in there, that consolidation. Okay. I'm just going to give my secretary a chance here. To yeah, I think uh, in the staff report there's a motion to approve, and it includes that the condition. Lot, I think Ginny just found that. Commissioner Higgins, 16. yes, 16, lot consolidation. Okay, so we don't need to, that's already in there. Didn't see that, thank you. Um, 
The applicant is proposing additional landscape to supplement the existing conditions. I don't think we need to make that a condition. That's probably already in what was proposed to us. So I think we're all set with that. Um, the emergency access drive is permitted by regulations, but subject to PNZ approval. So we would have to make that a condition of allowance of the emergency access onto a middle road. They would have to come back. For, first of all, there would have to be a tax amendment. No, 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 not, no. The emergency, the emergency access, access to middle oh, road. Oh, the emergency oh. access. Yes, yes. So that, that yeah, should be a condition that's, that's, that. That's fine. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to make that a condition to approve the emergency access onto middle road. That seems to be agreed. That's what you guys are really asking for. Yeah, it's part of the site plan. So yep. if you approve the site plan, you're approving the access. Uh, the parking. Um, do we need to make a... a, a a change in, for the 362 since basically we're, our regulations is 404. Yep. So that should be a condition that we're allowing 362 parking spaces, if that's agreeable to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting these out. We still need to discuss these, but I just want to try to cover them all. Yep. No, no I mean, staff has no. 317 yeah, ITE recommendations. Yeah, me too. We'd right, be honest no, with staff you. has no issue with the, the number that's proposed by the applicant. Um, and I think to simplify it, if, if, if that's the number that's on the plan, you approve the plan, that's the, that's the okay. number. Okay. I think we've kind of already anticipated doing a text change work with you possibly in the future going forward about that curb cut extra road and going down the line. Do we need to include as a condition the um, WPCA requirements? Which basically, um, I'm not, I don't think I, it's mostly about the aquifer. I, I probably, just an example, the boundary aquifer protection in the area should be shown on the plans. Clean roof runoff from any building in the aquifer protected area shall be completely disconnected from the stormwater conveyance. Do we need to include those in this particular case? I think we included those bullets in the memo. Yep. We did. We did include those bullets. Those are excerpts directly from the, the water authorities. Uh, yes, we're not in the motion to approve. So should we add that as a I condition? Think it was in the motion I think. Approved. Well, I think we'll add those as a condition if that's agreeable to. Absolutely. So I think if we add the uh, WPCA comments as a condition, it's a condition number nineteen in the memo. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's kind of. Yeah. I mean, it, by. The wording of, of 19 is kind of you think simple. that covers you think that covers it, Matt? But yeah. that that refers to the bullets because those bullets came directly from the water company. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <coughs> All right. So it looks like you have everything covered here. We yeah. What about the aquifer? Well, that's what we're just talking that's about. Right. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's what 19. we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. But the WPCA um, requests were also uh, uh, in the, the, the motion to approve. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my only other concern is, is, to, is I, you know, I certainly understand the need to be able to, certainly during parts of the construction, to use the middle road. And I certainly haven't gone over there and been familiar with the site uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, I am concerned. I understand your need to use it at time to time, especially during certain phases of the construction. It's just because hazard average is going to get bombarded and just for the access and out. But I guess just from a commissioner's standpoint, I'm hoping you're cognizant of that and that your construction agent is, is cognizant of that and uses that as sparingly as possible because that is basically a residential zone. Even though it's not flooded with a lot of houses, there are three or four houses on that outline that are, that are close and it just if you're cognizant of that, um, we, sir, I think we certainly understand your need to, to do that from time to time with this construction because that part's hazard out is going to be a nightmare at times. So I just wanted to make that point for the record. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is our community too. So there's there's n n nobody out there that's, that can't be one of our customers. So we're not looking to make any enemies. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> and, I, and I would say that if if staff is getting complaints, you know, you should communicate to the, to, to to Trinity and let them know that they need to cut back on the use of that that driveway. Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll be on site every day. I mean, okay. it, it is my site. And, okay. And, and, yeah, and I know almost all of those neighbors by name. So. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd like to see a little bit of extra narrative on traffic during construction. Yeah, we, we, Not, we can definitely do that. Nothing big, just a small thing. Yeah, there was a request to meet with uh, staff, I believe, uh, yeah. for construction phasing, so that can be part Thank of our discussion as well. 
Does staff have any, any I'm, I'm looking around here, I think everyone was, does staff have any more comments or anything like to discuss uh, with us? We don't have any more comments on the technical parts. We did want, I think, take the opportunity to thank Johnson slash Trinity uh, for assembling an, an exceptional team of professionals. And it's been a pleasure uh, to work with your team. And we're really, really looking forward to finally moving this, moving this along and getting a shovel in the ground. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank That's you. all we had. Thank you. Looking back, I think we're done. If the guests left the secretary, make a motion. Oh, I, I just oh, want to make a just a quick comment. Just as we are going Thank through you. the zoning regulations, I hope we can take this example, as with many others that have come before, to re revisit our excessive parking requirements. As we see, developers come to us every, you know, nearly every meeting, requesting an exception to our extraordinary parking. <laughs> requirements. So that's just a, something for us to take back as we're revisiting our uh, Thank you. requirements. I tend to agree with you, Commissioner D'Antonio. I, 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 I think the, I, I always call it tar. Less asphalt, more natural. Is it better for our environment here in Enfield, especially with the amount of aquifers and things we have? So I tend to agree. With you. Let's, let's not forget that thought as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve uh, application number SPR 1888. Uh, in conformance with the resolution prepared by staff dated 4 28 2022 and with the 32 conditions listed as well second I, I think we also have to make caveat that they are removing the curb cut no, it's, already it's already in there okay okay so second motion made by secretary Petronel. second second and by already by commissioner higley sorry oh, commissioner sorry. Any discussion on a motion? No. Looking through. Here. Secretary, please call the roll. Yes. Um, Lou Fiore. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Francis Alimo. Four. Kiran Majmudar. Four. Uh, Ken Halinski. Four. And John Petronola is four. Thank you. Let the record show is unanimous. Seven nothing. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Happy building. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Don't forget, you have a floppy stuck in somewhere for the presentation? <clears throat> oh. oh, okay. Okay. Okay, everybody all set? You guys all set? Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, C824, Referral Pearl Street Relocation of the Civil War Soldiers Monument. Since the town of Enfield is the applicant of this, I know the staff will want to start us off on this referral. So yes, um, so the town is moving forward with the demolition of the Strand and La Magna. There is a whole um, plan of attack to uh, have them demolished and redeveloped. And in so doing, there's also a uh, the Civil War Soldiers Monument. Um, which will need to be relocated. So um, uh, the town manager and um, a number of staff were talking about um, creating a pocket park. Um, I wanted to say this right. So uh, to the corner piece of Main and Pearl Street by the bridge across from Corona's and the old firehouse. So there is that little like green space there. So they'd like to actually make that a park. Um, and ultimately, although you do, do not have to do this tonight, they were thinking of moving the Civil War Monument to that location. So um, uh, Ellen, town manager, pr uh, provided for a, uh, she gave us a, a pretty lengthy uh, memo, which we, I received this evening. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to go further into it. No. no. Okay. I think, I we'll think save, so. we'll, we'll save you the I didn't think so, read it all. I just thought I'd offer. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any discussion on, are you, are you all set? Discussion sure. on this referral, Commissioner DeGray. Yes, um, that statue has been in that location for over 137 years. I feel that if we move it from that location, it's kind of showing a disrespect because it's not only Civil War, it's World War I it's honoring. 
And if we need to move it, we need to move it to the town hall uh, green yeah. with the other memorials that we have for our veterans that have served and to put it in a pocket park in an obscure location is disrespectful to those who have served. So I'm very, very upset that we need to move it to begin with because it is part of our history. I mean, Enfield's had a really rich history in the Civil War and along with the Underground Railroad. So to be moving it, I feel is disrespectful. And, I, and we've had buildings torn down and reconstructed in that area without moving it. That's my personal feeling. Thank you. Commissioner Higley? I totally agree with uh, Commissioner DeGray. I, th I think that it should go, if it's going to be moved, I think it should go to the town green because that's the unofficial gateway to the Thompsonville area. Um, I like where it is, but I understand if there's a need to move it, that it should come to the green and not further down. Commissioner LaFacus? I, I third that. Um, I, I'm in total agreement with what you have both said. Um, if you were here in 1955 or saw photographs of 1955, a lot of water was spilling mm -hmm. through there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're approaching the 70 years, so if that was a, a one in a hundred year t storm, we're getting close. I wouldn't want to put something that's valuable there. If you go down to the Thompsonville Cemetery at the end of Pleasant Street, there are a lot of Civil War dead. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to continue to honor that. Yeah. yeah. I believe the pocket, if I can, and I want to come back at the end, but I just, I believe, and I, again, I have about as much information about this as you have. Um, so if I can give you just a, if, if I may. If I can give you a little history about referrals, I'm sure some of you probably already know. I was at the other end of the referral at one time where the planning zoning refused to refer something. And then the council, we had to set up a special building committee for a building that the planning zoning didn't agree that. And Mr. LaFacus, <laughs> Commissioner LaFacus is smiling at because I know he sat on that PNZ at the time, which was fine. Um, so clearly, having gone through that, I understand the need for communications on these types of projects. And even though I commend the information we received kind of lately, at the late end on this, um, I, think, I think we need to go home and read this wonderful document that the town manager gave us. And now it has a lot more information in it that we didn't have prior to tonight. And that's no fault of, of, of Lori and her staff. Um, before we... Um, decide if we are even going to uh, accept this referral. And again, the council can still do whatever they want without it, just they have to just a little bit more of a roundabout way to do that. Um, I too remember all of that about the monument. It's part of our, for us locals, it's part of our history. It's been there, I, but I certainly understand what potentially might be happening in that little corridor there and the need for possibly having to move it, even though I like the ideas that's already been brought about possibly where to move it to. The pocket part, I think, would be where I remember is probably where LaRusse's appliance store basically was, I believe, a little bit before that. But pretty much I'm pretty close, right? Pretty, um, I'm not sure if that's appropriate or not. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure, nor are we privy to the council conversations about this. Um, but I would like to recommend, I, I think, unless someone else wants to comment on it, I would recommend that we this be tabled. Mm -hmm. So we can go home, we can uh, read this and, and, and take a back on this the next meeting. Council Monster. Uh, came to us as a referral from town, town council. council. Yep. So in order for us to send it back wherever, does it mean we say, assuming we have done all our homework, yeah. that our recommendation is such and such? And that's how it works. I'm trying to understand the process. Well, we, well, well, we can we could either send it back a referral is positive. We agree with what you want to do, and you have our permission. I think it's part of our charter and state statute. We have to participate at some level with these types of projects, yeah. or we can decline on a referral and not, um, you know, a negative vote. The council can still do something else differently. They can set up our own special committee. It's a temporary planning zoning commission to do what they they want. There's a way to circumvent that, and that's their prerogative. 
That's their prerogative. Or we possibly even could send a referral, a quasi referral back with suggestions. I'm not really sure. I know what I'm going to be doing. So to, <laughs> I'm going to, if I can, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to, I'm going to be on the phone with um, the councilman that I'm familiar with and talking about it with them. What's going on here? So yeah. there are yeah, three we options: yes, no, or maybe we'll do something different. Yeah, I was, yes, just gonna, I was just going to say you could you could send a referral to create the pocket park, and you could resend you could send a referral for the relocation of the monument, separate if you'd like. Yeah, I think we just need to. Yeah, I agree. With okay. You. Yes. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. saying you have to do it this right. evening, and and right. I could reword right. the this motion so things. you can almost it can be have because this is this is two separate things. Right. It's the pocket park and Lori. and and the monument. Right. These are two separate things. Yep. Through the chair, please. Yep. Go ahead. If we approve the pocket park, are they allowed to move the monument? Because we approve property, and that's a statute. So, in other words, do we have to approve moving the statue, or can they move it without our approval? If we approve the pocket park, can they go forward and move the monument? I, I think that you could approve the pocket park and have your comments as to where the monument should go. But they could move it to the pocket park without our approval. I, I think. Go around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my point. Yes, that, yeah. that is yeah. possible. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah, it can't be done. That's why I'm saying I don't. My personal opinion, I mean, sat even if it I, isn't a park, right. theoretically, I guess I could go there. But as as you probably haven't gotten that far down, as they're trying to f just find out from historic uh, as to how this monument can be moved and where it can be moved, and so yeah. on and so forth. And that's why I'm recommending that we we table this. We, there might be more yep. information coming, yep. and it gives us a chance to digest it and talk to some other people as we move along here, see what's going on. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I do have a comment. Yeah, please. Um, I take a little alternate view of, of honoring the veterans. I, I think the veterans of the Civil War, the reason that statue was located there was because that was the center of town, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I mean, and, and that's what they were fighting for. So I don't think it's really disrespectful to say <clears throat> that you're going to move it there. You, basically, what you can do is leave it there. You know, you're moving it yeah. a short distance. So I, I guess I don't see the disrespect there. I, I think it actually enhances the statue and the memorial by saying we're going to leave it in close to the original area where these people lived and worked, you know, the veterans. So, so just some food for thought. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Is there a motion on the table? So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner. I heard of Me. Commissioner. <laughs> let's get a second table. Uh, uh, 824 referral, Pearl Street, location mine. All those in favor? Aye. So the, the unanimous to table this. And I, I'm sure, Laura, you'll be asked some questions about this tomorrow, and you'll you'll fill them in. Who's ever not watching? I know we have a. I know we have one. I know we have one councilman in the audience as it is. So. Okay, so now we're going to be moving back to, give me one second here to get my notes. Now we're going to be going moving back to new public hearings, item C, which is XZA 3040. The secretary. Yep. Uh, Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold public hearings at the regular meeting on Thursday, April 28, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application. Uh, application Z or XZA number 3040, text amendment to allow recreational retail and production of marijuana establishments, Town of Enfield applicant. Since we are the applicant, would staff uh, care to start this off? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, my mic was not on. I'm going to do that again. I'm sorry, my mic was not on. Since the town of Enfield is the applicant, would staff uh, like to start this off, please? Yes. Getting there. Yeah, no problem, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, just as a sort of a legislative recap, in 2021, the Connecticut General Assembly passed Public Act 2029, 20, 
which permitted the retail sale and cultivation of recreational marijuana. Senate Bill 1201, Section 148, authorizes municipalities to enact zoning regulations for cannabis establishments. Should the municipality not officially opt out or fail to enact appropriate zoning regulations, the use will automatically be regulated as a similar use, so that would be retail or agriculture. The town of Enfield at this time has not opted to ban cannabis sales and cultivation. Thus, we are moving forward to adopt regulations for these uses. Currently, the town of Enfield, I'm sorry, uh, yes, the town of Enfield will be able to accommodate one retail space and one cultivator based on population. A new numerical cap may be established by the legislature on July 1st, 2024. The proposed text amendment was sent to Krog for review. Their comments were that they found no conflict with regional plans and policies or concerns with neighboring towns. So the staff had actually, wrong mouse, the staff had actually created, well, I'm just going to go through this PowerPoint, this, this PowerPoint. Um, so town of Enfield, so um, the staff and this Planning and Zoning Commission spent numerous evenings discussing these regulations. So what they finally came up with is separation requirements for, um, well, this is excluding, excluding Thompsonville. So it would be the separating distance for um, production and dispensing facilities, 200 feet from a residentially zoned property, 100 feet from a property containing a residential use, regardless of zone, um, 1,000 feet of existing, 1,000 feet from existing dispensary or production facility, 1,000 feet from public building, public park, recreation areas, and places of worship, and 1,500 feet from schools. Within Thompsonville, it would only be in the um, TD4, TD5, and and just um, portions of the TD2, which basically fall under the building's ground facility that is currently in that zone. Um, the separating distance would be 100 feet from public buildings, public parks, recreation areas, places of worship, 1,000 feet from an existing dispensary or production facility, and 1,500 feet from schools because of the um, distressed nature of the area. Um, if we were to actually have a separating distance from residential in Thompsonville, nothing would be permitted there at all just because of all the residential. So it's considered more like a, oh, it's almost, almost like a city. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't go into the details of the regulations at this time unless anybody has more specific questions. Was there something specific about the parking in Thompsonville? The parking, to yes, actually, the parking in Thompsonville. So if, there, if any of these facilities are located outside of Thompsonville, they basically have to f follow our standard parking requirements. Um, one per 150 square feet per um, sales or customer areas in dispensing facilities. Cultivation would be one to 250 square feet gross leasable, for gross leasable area. Um, parking requirements in Thompsonville basically would require that the uh, retail have four spaces per 1,000 square feet of lease area. So and basically that falls in the, the parking from Article 10.10? .10. Right. Okay. Specifically from the Thompsonville uh, regulations, the and, TODs. And, and Thompsonville is 8.123. It, it actually, actually, it that's a, a, a mistake. It's 8.124. 124, that's what I thought. Yeah. That's so what I was I looking asked. at that today. I was like, that's not right. Okay. So I think that was just a typo. That's okay. Thank so you. in short, that's what the proposed regulations are based on what this commission had discussed and decided upon. So if I can, just to bring everybody back up to date again, um, as you know, the state of Connecticut is, has approved this. 
and the town council has approved this. There is going to be a lottery, per se, for um, dispensaries and cultivation. The town of Enfield does, because of the Thompsonville district being distressed, not the town of Enfield as a whole, but the Thompsonville area, because that is considered a distressed area. So think of it as, as Lori was saying, as a almost a separate town in a way, or whatever you want to classify it in this case. Um, we do qualify for this lottery, not to all of Enfield, but just Thompsonville. Um, the chance of us getting picked are maybe, maybe, and maybe not, who knows. But if we don't, then there's basically at, at a minimum another year, possibly a two year wait before um, the rest of the retail area would be able to qualify for this. Um, so I wanted to bring you, that's why we proceeded down the road at looking at the TD5 and 4 and 2 zones with some minor adjustments uh, to the regulations. Just to, just to bring back in history, I know we've all, I think, I'm not sure, Commissioner Lefakis, if you were part of the discussions when we were doing this, but just to rehash everything where we were for about two or three meetings going through all this and looking at other towns, and we thought that this was pretty uh, agreeable. So again, that was just um, wanted to get my comments in as chairman before we proceed with uh, any more conversation. Anyone like to add anything? Commissioner DeGray, go ahead. I do want to, uh, because I know there's lots of discussion about mm -hmm. where the um, 100 feet is measured from, and I want to read it from the regulation so that people understand that the separation distance means a straight measurement taken from the nearest lot line of the proposed use to the nearest lot line of the protected use. So that 100 feet in Thompsonville is from lot line to lot line, not from the center of the property to the next center of the property. So it does change some things, but it does, I think will make people understand it a little right. bit more. And if I may, this, I didn't finish going no. through this PowerPoint. The, the staff put together um, separating distances from churches and schools and things. So this is the overall town map. The pink circles are areas where you may not have either facility. This kind of gives a little bit better picture of it. Um, there's a lot of areas that will not be allowed to have any of these facilities, either a, a retail sales or cultivation. That's that's currently based as as of that's most current information we have. Again, there's right. a lot of areas that are not going to qualify to right. be able to there's be either cultivation or retail. Not. And then this is um, Thompsonville. So there's very limited areas that would actually be permitted. I think I've put my glasses on. And that's the whole point is very limited areas. Yeah, so so these yellow areas and the, the well the blue is actually residential so that wouldn't be allowed anyway so but in the yellow, yellow area TD5 uh, TD4 mm -hmm. and here so it's it's very limited as it is so and I think that was graphically kind of, to show you I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt I apologize sorry, no problem. again there's just if I can just again to bring us off again I think that was basically what we were trying to do was try to open the door but be as limited and reasonably limited as possible and I think that was our whole intent yep. uh, right from the beginning um, so with that uh, any any more discussion questions because we do have to open up for public comment okay so I guess what I do have uh, something I need to read public comment because I know all of you are here for this I know you've been patiently waiting Can you can you blow that up, Lori, at all? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Can I? You want me to blow it up? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If I can figure that out. Nope. That means it was a full screen. That is full. Slideshow. Slideshow. Thank you. Right in the middle of the pic in the thing. There you go. I don't use these. There we go. There's a slideshow that makes your eyes go free. Is that better? Can you can everyone see in the back now? That's better now. Thank you, but that's where it's written. Okay. 
technology. Here comes Alex. Oh. I don't know what they're talking about. Just the yellow. There you go. What I had was probably We're going to pause here for a minute while we uh, get our technology up. Doesn't make it any better. That's a little, that's a little better. Can everybody kind of see that? Yeah. No. If you if you can't wait, please feel free to move up front. Okay. So what is the yellow? The, the that's where that can't. We're not gonna. We're not gonna do this right now. No. When you when you come up, we'll answer your question for you. We're not gonna do this with the audience. Well, then when some, the first person to come up can ask a question, and we'll answer. Okay. All right. So we're ready to start the public hearing. I do we need to read something so we all understand where we're going to be going here tonight. Uh, before we start this public hearing, I just want to go over some ground rules about how we will proceed. As I explained before, public comment is only permitted on matters that are on the agenda. The only issue concerning this application, let me be very clear about this, the only issues on this is whether we will remove the special provisions put in place many years ago that restrict sales of alcohol around churches and parks in order to allow a cannabis facility to be built outside a 100-foot buffer of these facilities and a special Thompsonville section to be built outside a 100 foot buffer of these facilities and the special tonsil checks and some parking adjustments. In addition to also allow that same type of activity in our various business and industrial zone. What is not on the agenda and what I will not permit is public discussion on whether the sale and cultivation of cannabis should be legal. That decision has already been made by the state legislature, the governor, and the Anfield Town Council. If anyone attempts to speak on that issue, they will unfortunately be asked to cease and their time to speak will be over. I do not mean to be heavy handed, but this commission has a job to do tonight and we cannot be distracted by relevant discussions. And given the amount of attention certain parties and various church groups have given this and other various items at other hearings, I fear this is an attempt, hopefully not, to turn to some sort of, of not spectacle, but attention. And I will not allow it to happen. So having said that, now that you all kind of understand the rules and where we're gonna be going here, we can start the public hearing. Looking forward to your comments and suggestions about um, how we're going to handle this. And, and quite frankly, if I can, just for the privilege of the chair, just very quickly, um, I'm curious as to what your input would be. I have a couple of questions I'm hoping you guys can answer to us. Have you ever been to one of the cannabis facilities in a nearby state or town? If so, which one? Was it what you were expecting? Some of us went on a tour and we did see some things and we were quite unexpected what we saw. I would also like to hear your thoughts as to why we have any distance restrictions in the first place. What purpose does the old relic of the blue laws serve? Why is it so magical about 1,000 feet as opposed to 5,000 or 10,000? And are you aware of any other business willing to develop something of this magnitude, both in generating tax revenue and the ability to attract other small businesses in Thompsonville? So I don't know, maybe you can give me some enlightenment on some of those questions. Hopefully you can help me. And with having that being said, the first person up, I believe, and if I mispronounce your last name, I do apologize. Dean, I think it's Gauss. Yes. Yeah. Are we doing five minutes? We're doing five minutes. Shouldn't take that long. Okay. Good evening, commissioners, staffs, and residents, both here and at home. My name is Dean Gauss. I live at 151 Spring Street, which is ground zero. I've come here tonight as a resident of the Thompsonville section to express my concerns about this amendment. It singles out a distressed area of the town and will cause it further distress by creating a unique set of separation requirements, specifically for the purpose of accommodating a single business. It's no secret that much of Enfield looks down on the residents of Thompsonville and the Thompsonville area itself. The separation requirements proposed only confirm to the families of Thompsonville that their investment and their children's future matter less than those that were located in more affluent areas of town. The Thompsonville area is more densely populated than other areas of town, where a 200-foot buffer between a business and residence may buffer eight or 10 homes surrounding that business in Thompsonville, as many as two or three times as many homes or families in the case of multifamily homes can be located within that same 200-foot buffer, which would, not exist, which would not exist for its citizens who would not be protected by that same separation the rest of the town would enjoy. No part of this proposal tells the people outside of Enfield that they should be looking here to settle in the most affordable part of town and raise a family. In fact, it tells the people who live here that they should be looking to get out to settle elsewhere. This is not a good look for our town. We understand the placement of a dispensary in, in Enfield is nearly ine inevitable. 
The residents of Thompsonville should know their investment, their families are valued equally by setting the same protective parameters as the rest of the sound. None of these separations are unreasonable for the rest of the town. Yes, the map of available locations would look different. There will still be areas of Enfield where this business can be located. If a dispensary is as popular as many believe it will be, it will thrive no matter its location. I'm not asking for Thompsonville to be treated differently. I'm asking for Thompsonville to be treated equally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Marie Pizner. Marie Pizner, 25 Roy Street, resident of Enfield. As a lifetime resident of Enfield and a person who was raised in Thompsonville, I remember our quaint downtown. And I've always hoped that we once again could bring it back. And for that reason, I am um, against the amending of the 1,000 the feet to 100 to accommodate recreational cannabis in Thompsonville. In the last few uh, years, we've made strides um, to revitalize our Thompsonville village to a gathering spot for our residents. With the train station coming and the redevelopment of some of our buildings, like the former firehouse, um, as well as the bait and tackle shop, um, we are beginning to see some of those strides take place. The Strand and the Angelo Lamagna Center are both parcels um, that, again, are going to become apartments and storefronts. Our pond, especially during fishing season, uh, attracts many young families. And with the addition of Higgins Park, we will truly start seeing our Thompsonville Village become more welcoming. When I pass by our town hall and I see our youth playing basketball and the playscape being used, it puts a smile on my face. This summer, there will be a band shell allowing live music to be played and a walking path for our residents. All of this is attracting young families as well as old. However, I believe that a cannabis dispensary would be a negative canceling out, canceling out all the hard work that's been done to build our village. I'm asking the PNZ to think about the future of Enfield and what your vision of the Thompsonville Village should be. I've said this before and I will say it again. Thompsonville is a brilliant diamond that just needs a good polish to make it brilliant again. So please, I hope you see that the same way as I do. Thank you. Lucian? Lucian Lefebvre, uh, 54 Kimberly Drive. Um, I don't understand why you make a difference from that 1,000 feet to 100 feet to accommodate one section of the town. And I realize that this is the only area that's eligible. However, you went, and I'm going to use a football field just as a reference. The 1,000 feet, you're looking at three football field lengths plus an additional 10 yards. You've shrunk that down to the 33-yard line coming out of the end zone for the distance. A mediocre quarterback can throw a 34-yard pass with no problem. I don't understand why the shrink, why the change in distance, and it just makes no sense to me that you would change one portion of the town versus the other parts of the town. It, the town is the town. The rules are the rules. To make changes, to, to fit different things in, just makes absolutely no sense. Like I said, I wouldn't want it 100 feet from where I was, and I don't think you, any of you up here want it 100 feet from where you are. So just rethink it. And I understand, you know, the, the state's legalized it. It's, it's a given. But we don't have to change rules to accommodate it. That's my comment. Thank, thank you. Thank you. 
Ms. Monroe? Hi, everyone. Sheila Monroe, 3 Stacey Lane. I hate these chairs. <laughs> <laughs> you um, might want to pull the mic a little closer yeah. to you. Yeah, there you Thank go. Thank you. Yep, welcome. Um, I was just talking off the cuff. Usually I write up something, but whatever. Um, I know many of you on the board, and um, I know that there's some places in Thompsonville. I've, al I've always had family ties in Thompsonville. Lived on Field Road at some point, but my grandfather family has always been Thompsonville. We can always look back and say, this could have been a little Northampton, you know, little quaint shops. They changed everything. They moved the statue once over a little bit. You know, it wasn't like the focus and you can go around it. And, and I totally agree. Thank you very much for that, those thoughts on the statue. Um, however, putting, the, and I knew once it was going to go through to be the town, where it was going to go. It's not going to go in Hazardville. It's not going to go any other part of town. And yes, it has to be a stipulation that it's got to fix up something. However, State Line has been an eyesore for a long time. We just had Johnson come through here, Trinity Health. If it's medicinal, why not put it on the health area? Easy in, easy out. I've been to them. I know people... Family members, they belong. You know, they, they've got their card. Anybody really now can get their card. Whether they're going to or not, I don't know. But um, Thompsonville has always, and, and you know, the T-ville name really irks me. It just makes it sound so bad. T-ville, it's a bad place. Drugs are there, crime is there. You know, it's the worst part of town. I've done a, the gardening at St. Pat's. I was there the whole summer. People are stopping. That looks great. Can we help? There's families. They're not the Italians. They're not the French anymore. They're the Mexicans and whoever. But they're just people living in the homes that they can afford. They don't need more of it in that area. So, and, you, and you've got the oldest church in town there and you only want to have a hundred foot buffer but a school now there's children and families going to the church but the school gets a 1500 there's no schools in that area where's their school in Thompsonville so why not make it a thousand around the you know around churches and, and parks or whatever that would limit it even more but Honestly, it's not an easy in, easy out going down to Thompsonville to get your medicinal marijuana. That's my point of view. And Thank I think you. it would be the demise of Thompsonville to further go down a path that we always been trying to fight to get out of. Thank you. Thank you. And we will try to answer some, to answer some of your questions when we get back to our discussion, just to let you know. Mas Schmidt? <clears throat> Matt Schmidt, 1304 Bigelow Commons. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm opposed to having different buffer zones or separation requirements in Thompsonville than for the rest of town regarding cannabis establishments. The argument for the proposed difference rests on an interpretation of the cannabis law as argued here on March 10th by present District 2 Councilor John Santanella. I believe Mr. Santanella misinterpreted that part of the law dealing with disproportionately impacted areas, their intent, their operation, and their application. Mr. Santanella stated that a disproportionately impacted area gets priority for the building site of a cannabis establishment. Except there is nothing in the 303 pages of Senate Bill 1201 that ties impact areas to site priority. Instead, what I found in the few pages that reference these areas is that residents of disproportionately impacted areas get priority through a special social equity lottery to obtain licensure. Mm -hmm. You see, the law created these disproportionately impacted areas to make up for the effect of the war on drugs on the people of these impacted communities. Mm -hmm. 
The law creates a social equity council that divvies out half the available licenses to people who qualify with no limitation or preference to where the actual retail establishment is put. A qualifying social equity applicant would be either, quote, a resident of a disproportionately impacted area for at least five of the past 10 years, mm -hmm. or a resident of a disproportionately impacted area for at least nine years before the age of 18. There is nothing about location being <clears throat> a determinant for special treatment. The Social Equity Council holds a lottery to determine who of these applicants gets a license. The law then states, quote, once all of the social equity applicants have been chosen, a general lottery will be run. So you see the priority is given to the social equity applicants, not to the area. A few examples might make things clearer. <clears throat> Let's say Ms. Cocktella, who lived at 5 Main Street before her home was taken through eminent domain, wanted to open up a dispensary up at Sherwood Manor. Or maybe she needed more room and there's some wonderful land available off Old King Street. She could be an applicant in the social equity lottery based on her residence. Whereas let's say some hotshot who lives across the river, bless you, some hotshot who lives across the river in Suffield wants to put a dispensary across from Corona's Market. Or some businesswoman from District 1 wanted to put a retail establishment next to Opera House Players. They would not be eligible for the social equity lottery. They would not get priority. That's because the site is of no concern when it comes to disproportionately impacted areas, only the residents of the cannabis entrepreneur. So contrary to what present District 2 Councilor John Santanella remarked, the Enfield Mall and any other location in town would still be in play when it comes to priority as long as the entrepreneur is from one of these impacted areas, whether it be Thompsonville or one of the areas in Hartford or even Waterbury. Yes, residents from outside our town will get entered into this prioritized lottery and can open up shop anywhere in Enfield which means creating different buffer zones in Thompsonville accomplishes nothing. The entire premise for the change is not supported by the law. So if you do enact this buffer zone disparity, these separation requirements, it would be done under false pretenses. What I would suggest is that this body delve into the 303 pages of statute, every aspect of it, so that we don't find out later we made a mistake about something so important. I'm told quite often that mistakes do happen but I would argue that they shouldn't when we have that knowledge beforehand to stop them from happening. So please, let's not make a mistake here. We don't need to be creating a de facto two-tier society in town through zoning. We already have enough divisiveness. Zoning buffers, like all the regulations this commission oversees, are meant to provide protection to our citizens. And I would argue that Thompsonville deserves equal protection. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Hamler. Kelly Hemmler, 10 Harford Ave. My grandmother all- Excuse me, Kelly. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Prisoner was nice enough to say she was here as a resident, because I know she has an official position. Are you here as a resident? I or, don't have a I'm not an elected you, official anymore. Well, yes, you are. And, and say, are you here as a resident? Yeah. Or not as chairman of the Republican Town Committee? Oh, no. That's, that's all I'm asking. Oh, okay. Thank you. No. Okay. Still new to me, so. <laughs> I just want to make sure for the record that you're here as a resident. Absolutely. Thank you. My grandmother always said that what is good for the goose is good for the gander, and I agree there's a lot of wisdom in those words. When it comes to a buffer between recreational marijuana shops and parks, churches, public buildings, you are considering zoning rules for Thompsonville that are different than the rest of the town. There's a, hundred, there's a thousand foot buffer for liquor stores, and that is town wide, which makes sense. Councilor Santanella wants to implement a 100-foot buffer between Thompsonville parks, churches, public buildings, and a recreational marijuana shop, while the rest of the town will enjoy a 1,000-foot buffer. And I'm refer referencing the planning and zoning meeting of March 10th, which also, by the way, on that meeting, if you review it, it said that the buffer started at the center of the um, structure and also said that you were going to be waiving the parking. I understand you're going to be just changing the parking, but at that meeting you said waiving. So what you're really saying is that Thompsonville parks and churches are worth less than other parks and churches of Enfield. The 100-foot buffer puts a recreational marijuana shop on the front steps of St. Pat's Church, or next to Town Hall, or across the street from the new basketball court and play skate for children. 
you're also considering the number of parking spaces normally required for businesses to be waived. So Thompsonville businesses, and trust me, I live here, the, the, the uh, parking is already at a premium. So anybody that's living near a dispensary would have to uh, compete for their parking space. These pres these provo these prof well, sorry these pres provo bleh. yeah take your time Pro provoked pr proposed zoning regulations will not elevate the lives of Thompsonville residents. Instead, they relegate us to second class citizenship and show no respect for our churches, family recreation areas, or public buildings. These provoked proposed zoning regulations will add pressure to an area that parking is already an issue, especially in the winter months. I'm here to, today to tell you that if a thousand foot buffer is good for the rest of Enfield, then it is good enough for Thompsonville. And if anybody's thinking, I don't live in Thompsonville, this doesn't affect me, please rethink that. This is a dangerous precedent to set. Today, this commission is considering treating Thompsonville neighborhoods differently than the rest of the town. Tomorrow, it could be your neighborhood that's treated differently. Thank you. Thank you. Albert, I think it's Keenan. Hi, I'm Al Keenan. I live on Burns Avenue. Um, well, I'm fortunate to go on after everybody else because they pretty much have expressed everything that I would have to say in one way or another. Um, my, I don't really have a concern with dispensaries as a business. It's the different set of rules for a, a section of town. It, it is, uh, if it's good for Thompsonville, to lower them buffers, would it not be good for the rest of town to have, the rest of the town to have similar lowered buffers? So you mentioned that antiquated blue laws. Well, if antiquated blue laws need to go, then they need to go town wide. Okay, so I mean that's my opinion. Is uh, T Thompsonville should not be singled out. It should be it should be either the whole town or none of the town that changes. Um, yeah, I really don't have anything else to say after that. I think the other speakers covered everything else. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Donna? Donna Swayzak? Well, <laughs> Suzak, I'm sorry. Well, I've been living here 70 years. I know. I've always mispronounced your last name. I apologize. That's okay, Lou. Donna Suzak, 35 South Road. I guess um, most people have said my concern is that you have to treat everybody equally. I mean, what the rules have to be the rules. But what I feel is being lost is that this is a controlled substance, just like alcohol. It's not like we're selling, you know, candy at the local store. And I happen to probably be one of the people who has visited the dispensaries, and I can tell you stories about my husband visiting the growing facilities. The dispensaries need parking because it takes people a while to get through. You know, you're not going to go in there and say, I'd like a half a pound of those. It's not like that. You know, it's a controlled substance. This is big money. It's not, you know, you do whatever you think you're going to do. Um, when they first got medical marijuana, the conversion of the um, Watertown, my husband was involved in. When you go there, you don't even get to wear your clothes. You have to go into a changing room and put on a suit that has no pockets, no anything. I mean, this, and, and I think, and I feel that we've lost the fact that this is a controlled substance. <laughs> It's not something that you're going to find at the five and dime store. And now that I see actually where it is in Thompsonville, and I listened to what you know, Mr. Schmidt said about reading this properly, I'm really concerned that you know in this lottery, someone could come from, and we always hate the absentee landlord, we could have the absentee dispensary person. And we do have a lot of factories that might make a great conversion. But please, think twice before you treat you know, things in a fashion that we're not giving them the respect that they are. 
and please respect the whole town and an equal playing field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Again, apologize for always doing that with your last name. Work on it, yes, right? I will. Okay. <laughs> Along with everybody else. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Is there anyone? Else? Yep. Come on, Karen. Yep. Does it work on backs? <laughs> <laughs> I base Karen Laplante, 166 North Maple Street. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself, not any border commission that I may be on. Um, I pretty much agree with everybody else. Why are we degrading the people of Thompsonville and, and allowing something like this in a much closer area to residential properties? Um, the parking, I have a question on, you know, these regulations don't look anything like our other regulations. And I don't know if it's because they were put together fast or not. But um, if if a facility is going to go on a retail establishment, is it going to be re come under all the other regulations that would, would they have to meet all the other regulations? It doesn't state that anywhere. It doesn't look like it does. Um, so I, I think before these actually become the regulations, I think that it's got to be cleaned up quite a bit. Um, the parking, again, I don't believe should be lessened because it's in Thompsonville. And I don't think the buffer should be lowered um, because it's in Thompsonville. Um, if 1,000 feet is good anywhere else in town, it should be 1,000 feet in Thompsonville. Um, so one of the items says um, the parking would go to 8.12 been corrected tonight as 8.124 for Thompsonville for the parking. Um, that's uh, GD um, of the page. And I'm wondering if we go to 8.124, is 6 and 7 also apply to that facility under 8.124, or 26 and 27? Because those are things where you can waive the parking, and, and I think that needs to be clarified, that if you're just going to one point, um, 8.124, is it 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or whatever? Um, regarding G, um, D, uh, B, cultivation is used, where all other references are production oh. facilities. Um, GB you're talking about. GB, yes. Um, where it says uh, production, it says cultivation shall follow warehousing parking. Well, it talks about dispensing and, um, and uh, let's see, dispensing and what's the other terminology they're using? Production. Dispensing and production as two different things. But now we've added cultivation as an item. It's so just, It's the same as production. Okay, but why change it? Why change it? Because there is a separate cultivation, a cultivator and a micro cultivator. So I think you're confusing it. Um, under EC4, um, under private recreation area, I would like to you to include land trust and private open space. As an example, CLMP land trust has a lot of land along the Connecticut River. It's forested. People are allowed to hike there. Um, I believe hunters are allowed to hunt up in the area um, north of uh, the old Hallmark property. Um, and uh, I believe your definitions would not allow that under private recreation area. It's not listed there. Land trusts? Land trusts and um, private open space, privately owned open space. And that does abut industrial land. Um, so, so the other question was, you know, 
Are these the only regulations that the establishments meet, need to meet? If a production facility is located in an industrial zone, do they need to comply with the other regulations of the industrial zone? It does not state that. I'm concerned with setbacks and buffer areas. As my house is in an industrial zone and I am concerned one of these facilities could be built within 100 feet of my house, uh, within 100 feet of my property. Um, I also don't agree with the 200 foot separating distance Distances in a residentially zoned um, area um, of a residentially zoned property for the areas excluding Thompsonville. Um, you're giving a competing production facility a larger separating distance of a thousand feet from another facility, existing facility, but our residences are already existing and I should be able to enjoy my existing quality of life. And 100 feet, I feel, does not minimize potential adverse impacts these facilities will have on existing residential structures. And um, I also feel the separation requirements within Thompsonville are inadequate. I currently own a rental property that is very close to North Main Street. Why are you thinking 1,500 foot separation from schools is good, but my tenants that may have children playing in the yard don't get that advantage? Why is the 1,000 foot separation from public parks and other areas okay, but in yeah. T-ville, only 100 feet? Five minutes. I gave you an extra 30 there. Yep. Are you, are you pretty much wrapped up? I uh, think we, yeah. I think we get the gist, I, yes. I, it's basically what everybody else said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I hate doing that. Didn't hear it. <laughs> I hate doing it. Anyone else? Yeah. Yep. Gretchen? I was going to miss my mic. It's close enough. Gretchen Pfeiffer Hall, Four Summers Road. Um, I pretty much agree with what everyone else has said, but I have a specific concern on um, Section F and production facilities and dispensing facilities are limited to TD5 zone, TD4 zone, and parcels within the TD2 zone of former municipal uses, which I believe refers to 52 Prospect Street, which is the buildings and grounds um, location. My husband and I own two properties that directly abut that property. That property um, potentially has access not only from Prospect Street, Thompson Court, and I believe it's called Keller Court. Prospect Street is, is narrow and there are many cars parked alongside, especially in right in that general vicinity. It's, it's difficult maneuvering um, down the street. Once you get down to Kelly Fredette, it, it opens up because Kelly Fredette has so much frontage, there's nobody parking. But on Prospect Street, where, where this property is, cars are parked on both sides of the street all the time. And I don't really think that any retail operation should be in that location, regardless of whether it's cannabis or anything else, because it's completely surrounded by residential properties. I wouldn't really have a problem with, with a production facility because I don't think it's gonna have the traffic but a retail facility would. And if they opened it up, well, they'd have to tear a building down on Keller to, to do that, but they could certainly do it from, from Thompson Court, and Thompson Court is just as narrow, and there's um, a really sharp curve in the road right where the, where the access point is in there. So I have a specific concern about that, I think that should be eliminated. I think, I know 
Well, I won't go any further than that. So the other thing is, you know, children playing. When I drive down there, I have to be really careful because you never know when somebody's going to come darting down. And and unfortunately, the other the other people who who live there or drive through there aren't as careful. And when you have people that don't live there and are just you know zipping in and out, they want to get in, they want to get out fast, and they're just not considerate. Um, I think it would be a dangerous situation. That's my specific concern. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Can you go for a second time? If you'd like to come up two times, I'll allow, I'll allow two times. Yep. Okay, Sheila, come on. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking. Thank you. You're Sheila welcome. Monroe, 3 Stacy Lane. Um, Early on when I knew the town was contemplating doing this, um, I work in Feeding Hills and um, a counselor in Agawam, I questioned him and because I know that they allowed it. They voted down doing the physical building retail, but only allow cultivation and production. And I don't know if everybody is familiar, but Chez Joseph is one of the facilities. There's no signage there. They made it quite clear. We don't want any signage. No trucks going in and out at, will advertise it at all. I don't, are you familiar with that? We're not choosing, so we're not quite well, no, but this is what they decided to do because it would be good for, yes, income, but not any impact on the citizens. Mm -hmm. So they get the benefit without the traffic, without the extra policing, without any, any detriment to the, and they just collect the profits. And there are profits in that. And being as though Enfield has been tobacco, um, farming, something like that would be easily, you know, fit into the community, so to speak. If we're going to it, we already have that going. So I just wanted to let you know that's definitely an option. You don't have to do both. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Make a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Well, we don't want to close the public hearing. We still have to do a discussion. But we'll close the public comment. We'll move on to discussion. I. Yeah, that was my fault. Retract Again. my motion. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> Retract that. Retract my second. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a variety of questions or, or things that were brought up here. It was, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a well, we're. <laughs> I was going to ask. It's okay. The yellow and the orange is the TD four and five zones. Yep. Yeah. So that's so. Where is that on that? That's where it is. Hmm? It's. Can we? Is there any way we can explain what the yellow part is? The actual streets. I don't think we have the streets on there. Or where it's located. Frankie, can you get up? I think you're yeah. probably more so knowledgeable than I am. Yellow is uh, the the more yellow to the north is North River. Yeah. Yep. And then to the south, obviously South River. The other yellow going down would be uh, Main Street, where yep. the bait and tackle shop is. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, the orange is uh, well. I'm not even going. Exactly. It gives you an idea of kind of where it is. There were some uh, questions raised. I'm, I'm going to attempt to answer a couple of them, just because I feel we owe the audience some answers, mm -hmm. some explanations. And if I um, misrepresent something, please feel free to correct me, commissioners. All right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm not sure I got everything. And um, um, some of it is, I'll be honest with you, some of them is just my general opinion. Um, first of all, we did negotiate this pretty much in good faith, all of the commissioners here. This wasn't one or two people. Um, any input we received from anyone outside this commission was strictly on our asking for it. No one solicited us. It was because we were looking for information. Uh, some of us, as you know, three council people and two commissioners did go on a tour. 
of a what I would call a destination facility in Holyoke, which was quite enlightening um, as far as what that could add to an environment. Um, I think part of what we have here is we looked at this and we are looking at this as a economic development, certainly understanding some of the limitations in the Thompsonville section. And that's one of the reasons why we tried to carve out something a little unique for those TD zones, because Thompsonville is a unique situation. I think there, if not almost all of us, most of us, or a lot of us, were born and raised in Thompsonville. And a lot of people still live in Thompsonville. My family goes back three generations there. Um, so we certainly understand most of the streets, most of the disadvantages and the advantages. So having said that, uh, the thousand foot buffer. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you, this chairman, I wouldn't have any buffers at all. I liked with, I think it was Mr. Keenan to come up here. I totally agree with him. I don't know why we're doing any buffers at all. Um, I want to thank Mr. Schmidt for bringing up the, the, the information on that. Um, I don't want to say we're assuming that there'll be a social equity partner from the Townsville section that might be applying for one of these licenses. Take that how that is. I don't have any inside information to that, but I think you could see where we were headed with that. Thank you again for your information you passed on to us. Um, the 1,500 feet around the schools was something that Commissioner Petronella brought up. That's the federal drug-free zone, I think the regulations, 1,500 feet around schools. So we thought that was appropriate. Um, in in every uh, district, be it um, Thompsonville or the rest of the rest of the town, we were going to stick with the federal drug free zone for fifteen hundred feet. Um, other than Donna, I don't think anyone mentioned that they've ever been to any one of these facilities. Oh, okay, so I'm basically, I think, as as you're well aware, and we discussed here, in, I think, in nauseum, there are two or three different kinds of facilities. I'm not going to talk about the cultivation or production one. I think that's self-explanatory what that is. Uh, but the retail part is, uh, we went up to the Massachusetts and, and we took a tour. And certainly, I would say, in my opinion, I, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Alimo, but we were um, surprised at the at the facility, what it offered, how it handled itself, the security. Um, this is not something where Johnny Joe is going to go there and buy a fifteen dollar bag of marijuana and then take it outside in front of the doorstep and, and smoke it. You can't do that. This, <coughs> these are destination areas where people were dropping over one hundred twenty five dollars a pop. Having said that, there are some of those facilities in Massachusetts, but not here. So again, we, we can use Massachusetts as a guide or a reference, but that doesn't always pertain here to what's going to happen in Connecticut. Um, You know, retail development is, is going to happen in Thompsonville. Economic development is going to happen in Thompsonville. We want it to happen in Thompsonville. The train station and what hopefully might be becoming other projects coming <laughs> along with that, it's going to impact parking. Whether it's cannabis or whether it's the train station, hopefully a train station responds some other uh, small businesses, it's going to impact parking. So I think, I think all of us here about, about the parking, but we can't stop what we want to happen at Townsville because of just the parking issues. Um, that, that they will resolve itself over time, and it's a consideration for us. But <coughs> if I went down and opened a, a nice wine store, that's going to impact the parking in some parts of Townsville. It doesn't matter. That's, that's the uniqueness of that particular uh, part of the town of Enfield, one that I know very well. So again, we need to develop. We need to be sponsoring redevelopment. We know it's going to impact parking, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge. Um, the other thing I want to mention about this regulation is that this is all by special use permit. This is not a site plan review. So if someone was fortunate or with a pending viewpoint unfortunate to get the lottery and be able to start a facility in town, they have to come back in front of us for a special use permit. This is not carte blanche site plan review where we're very limited to what we can do. They have to come from a special use permit where we have a lot of input and a lot of say into that. Having said that, I think... I addressed some of the issues. I did like, um, I think one, uh, I think Ms. LaPlante brought up a, a thing about adding to this. Maybe we can do that tonight if we're so uh, inclined to add the land trust to um, uh, e -C -E -C -E .C four. If we can, Mr. Chairman, that would be possible if that's your okay. desire. I, I would, and of course, we do have to make a change also because it's Article 8124. 
So having that, I'm going to I'm going to take a little yeah I'm going to take a little break here. So if someone someone else would like to comment, any suggestions at all? Is there a motion to add these uh, for item E dash C dash four at the end of that paragraph where it says uh, indoor open or guided play areas, camps, land trusts. Open space. And private open space instead of and the like, I guess. Motion made by Commissioner Higley. Second. Seconded by Commissioner DeGray. And also on item G, uh, the art where it said article 8123, it should be article 8124. Is there a motion to, to make that change? So moved. So motion made by uh, Commissioner Higley, seconded by Co Commissioner DeGray. Also, is there a motion to waive all the setback? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> See, I like to have a, I like to have a joke. <laughs> Sorry. Right. See, I got everybody smiling. See. <laughs> is there staff have any more comments? Nope. Not at this time. Any more? Com uh, any more from the uh, commission? Any, any comments, or Commissioner D'Antonio? Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to comment that I know there's a lot of comment from the public about uh, differentiating between Thompsonville zones and and other, you know, basically the rest of uh, the town. Uh, there's a lot of precedent for that. What we're doing here isn't particularly unique, um, right? We do treat Thompsonville differently because it is that more urban walkable uh, and and just human centric design which does change our zoning um, and then there's also you know other other design districts in town uh, but I, I just want to point out to, to everybody that there there is a lot of precedent for that um, in Enfield just in zoning overall um, I mean we could even <laughs> right I'm not even going to get into the point of like loosening zoning right because there there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, opinions where zoning is is overly restrictive uh, and Thompsonville is actually more flexible zoning um, but I, I just want to point out again the precedent that we have and I don't think we're overreaching here I think we've all kind of come to that conclusion and yep thank you thank you thank you very much for those comments that's a uh, well well said thank you Commissioner Tony having said that um, I'm not sure what the secretary should read here. Any more yeah. Oh, it, it, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you asked. Any more comment? No. No. Go ahead. So, um, so you mentioned the, the trip that we went on, and um, so I asked a ton of questions, mm -hmm. and I took what everybody was saying on both sides. There was a lot of motion over the summer, as you all remember, and um, I was very impressed by the operation. It's a very good business. It's a busy business, and the people that run it are very good, and the security was really good, and all the stuff people worry about in that sense, I think it's covered. Very highly regulated. It's actually harder to transport cannabis than it is alcohol. I mean, it's from the time it's manufactured, it's, it gets a stamp, and it gets a stamp when it's delivered and when it's sold. But one of my biggest takeaways was that she said, the owner, that we should consider a retail area. Look for a retail area would be the best bang for our buck, like the mall area off the highway. Because she was saying that you really need to have a lot of parking and a minimum of seven cash registers because it's a phenomenal amount of money. It's crazy money. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time looking at, you know, emphasizing and looking at Thompsonville to get something down there, but it seemed like they were saying the opposite, to go into a retail area off the highway with plenty of parking. And, and I agree with the chair and the gentleman who spoke about the distancing. You know, why, should, why do we have any distances? Let's have none. You know, and um, I, I agree with that, too. And I don't know if we're teetering on spot zoning here, or if we're what we're doing here too. I just want to make sure we're not spot zoning when we're looking at these little individual spots in Thompsonville. So um, 
I think we may be better off just having all of the town uniform to the liquor uh, regulations we have and just not consider this piece we're doing in Thompsonville because of the fact, and like I said, that was my biggest takeaway that we all actually shouldn't have it in an area like Thompsonville. It should be in an area that has major access and parking and plenty of square footage. And that's what they suggested. So that was my biggest takeaway. So I can throw it out there for anyone well, I would like to make to, any amendments. I would, or, I would like to mention that the mall's off limits. Can't go in the mall because there's a church in the mall. Yeah. Well, that, that one mall. <laughs> well, then we get, yeah. get, rid of the, get rid of the distances. Yeah. Well, well so, get, so make the distances the same in the rest of the community. I would have no problem getting rid of all the distances, period. Zero. Yeah, so what's good for Thompsonville could be good for the rest of the town. I, I, mean, have, I have no problem. Because get, they really... They, other, other than the drug-free zone around the schools, right. I would have and no problem getting I, I, rid of every was, single distance. And you remember all, all the questions I engaged with them uh, and the owner there. They said to do it in this place like that. And I was thinking, of, you know, the old Best Buy would have been great, but now it's going to be... I know. I know. Now it's going to be used, but... Um, that was their that was their that was my biggest takeaway. Are you, are you making this in a form of a motion or you want any more discussion or we're going to I'm I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm asking I'll, I'll how you want to handle this because right now basically we we have this in front of us mm -hmm. and what you're you go ahead you make your motion and I'll see no, if that'll stick. I, I mean I'll, I'll I'll make an amendment to amend uh and just uh, There's no more discussion. But you haven't discussed your concern. Well, None of you. I I anything about my concern about 52 prospects. No. No, well, well, that's what spot. That's what I was saying about spot zoning. We don't. We don't take. We don't oh, take sorry, questions from the audience, no. Gretchen. I'm sorry. That's what. Well, that's when I was thought we were teetering so you're on making a motion. No, so I'll just going back. Okay. To, to the, so that's where I picked up the, the spot zoning piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that is the parcel that okay. she was describing. Okay. And we know we know the town's sure. selling it. Yep. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, I would make a motion to amend to just have everything. Um, Uniform uh, so which, which uni the whole community. Which, the which distances. Which, which one? Take Frank, away. Alimo. Take away the distances in Thompsonville, and so basically your motion is to same, or make the or make the rest of the town the same as Thompsonville. Well, either one. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Whichever you. I mean, we'll throw, throw it out for discussion. What would you know? Is there any discussion? Dis any discussion? Either or. I mean, what would any, people think? Does anyone want to discuss this motion? Is there at first? Is that made in a formal form of motion? Yeah. You need a second. But but. But you can't. You have to do one or the other. You can't say yeah. either one. So make a motion what you would like us. You can't say either one. So I, I would say make the rest of the town like Thompsonville. Make a motion to amend uh, the rest of the community to reflect the zoning that we're going to have in Thompsonville. Okay. So basically you're saying the separation, making a motion that the separation requirements in item E, A, and B also reflect the separation items in F. B and C. Correct. And that would make it uniform throughout the community. There is a motion made to um, uh, remove items E, A, and B, or substitute items E, A, and B, the same as items F, B, and C. It's a motion made. Yep. There was a motion made. I have not heard a second, Mr. Olimo, so I guess the motion is not going forward. But thank you for the discussion. So having said that, is there any more discussion? Mm -hmm. So, Secretary? Oh. So, I would yep. just like to say yep. what I've heard tonight was the people who spoke for the Thompsonville uh, buffers and, and that, it felt like they mm -hmm. felt disrespected. That And I remember in the first discussion, I said we should just have one set of regulations and maybe address Thompsonville later on. I still felt feel that way. I feel that we should have just one set. Maybe two, three years down the road, things change. We can only have one dispensary. We can only have one cultivator or whatever for the population. Um, I, I've, I, I'm hearing that, I'm hearing about the parking, the street widths, the, you know, the traffic. 
the lottery hasn't happened yet. We don't know who these people are going to be. We have no idea where they want to go. If we'll even be selected, mm -hmm. it'd be, you know, it would be a plus, I guess, for the town. I, I don't know. I don't go to the businesses. I have no idea. But um, I feel we should just have one s set of regulations as opposed to, and I understand, we do have separate regulations for Thompsonville. And if we could get a business down there and it could build and create some kind of movement toward more economic development down there. I mean, we did, during the last revite, tear down most of the Thompsonville section. We need people to come in. The town doesn't build. We need people to come in. But I'm, from what I'm hearing is we get People that come, and it's a big business. It's not a small little store front. It's big business. We need a bigger place. So I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'm in that, where do you draw the line? How do you just make the regulations? And I understand the regulations for Thompsonville, because if there's an opportunity to draw business down there, that they would build something, <clears throat> build it and they will come mm -hmm. um, that would be great for that it would be a boost to the economy but we also have the narrow streets the parking issues um, and I'm hearing just that the people in Thompsonville are feeling disrespected in some way that's my okay. take okay so okay that's just what I got to say okay thank you Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Lefakis? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seated to, to, to be voting on this no. tonight as an alternate, but um, I, I, I'm agreeing with the comments that uh, Commissioner DeGray and Alimo um, just made. Okay. It makes sense to me, too. Okay. Well, there was a motion on the floor to do, the, do something. I know you can't really second it. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Holinsky, are you all set? Commissioner Holinsky? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at more of an overhead view of the Thompsonville area. I and mean, we're doing a lot of things down there as far as uh, trying to develop it with the train station. Your mic, Ken. Your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Why don't you start again? <laughs> I'm, I'm taking an o uh, more of a, a, uh, an overview of the area and the issue here. And what I'm looking at is that we are put a lot of time and effort into developing the Thompsonville area. And I think as such, I think that gives a lot of respect to the area. I don't, I don't see where there's any disrespect meant uh, here at all. I think, I think that uh, this, you know, cannabis is here to stay for now. Um, and it's a good business. I think it's a good business to have in the Thompsonville area. And I think we should create some kind of advantage that, that might give uh, a developer incentive to put a facility there. Uh, you, you hopefully will generate some traffic with the train station. Uh, you know, I envision coffee houses and all kinds of good stuff down there. Uh, and I think this would be something that would be an advantage to that area, not a disadvantage. Thank you, Commissioner Holinsky. Okay. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking. Are we ready to proceed? Is there any other discussion? So basically, Mr. Secretary, I think you need to, I don't think he needs to read the whole text, just need the highlights of the text for us to have a roll call vote on the text. Mic on, yeah, yeah. The uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, but um, uh, the motion <clears throat> um, is is, uh, is 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 prepared in a memorandum from the uh, Enfield Planning and uh, Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, 
Uh, and, and it reads as follows. Motion to adopt recreational cannabis regulations to allow the sale of cultivation of recreational marijuana. See attached regulations, which are um, this document as we're all referring to. Now, we made an amendment to Article EC4 yep. uh, to include land trust and private open space. And we made a correction to um, Article GD, uh, which changed Article 8.123 to 8.124. That's correct. Make a motion to waive the rest of the reading. I move to waive the rest of the remainder of the reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Holinsky. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, second by Commissioner Holinsky to waive the reading of the whole text. Having said that, motion has been made and second. We've had some discussion. So I guess we'll take a roll call vote. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to make a motion to close the public hearing. Yes. You yeah, we yeah. did. Yes, we did. Right. It's getting late. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Give her a second, uh, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, who, did, who seconded John's motion? Commissioner Holinsky. Thank you. So we're going to have a roll call vote on this uh, text uh, enhancement change uh, as amended. And the secretary is going to call the roll. Okay. Uh, Lou Fiore. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Uh, Francis Alimo. Against. Thank you. Uh, Kiran Majmudar. Four. Uh, Ken Holinsky. Four. And John Petronella is four. Thank you. Let the record show that it was six an affirmative and one uh, at uh, denial. Having said that, the... Uh, Text has changed. It's now part of our regulations. Moving on to other business. Old business. Well, why don't we give? We're gonna just recess here for about three minutes until this one leaves. Okay. Alex.
Alex, we're resuming the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's getting, getting kind of late. Yep. Um, we're going to move through. Old business, any old business? Any other business? Any correspondence? Any commissioner's correspondence? Any director of planning report? No. Okay. Applications to be received. That's okay. I will tell you what she just said. You hope so, right? See, Mr. Chair, yeah. there was a, a, a townsperson here that was concerned about some questions she had raised in responses. Are we going to, early on? Or are just going to do that? Uh, uh, I, I can respond to that. At the last meeting, I said I would respond, and I did start writing out the answers, and we were just extremely busy with this and lawsuits and things of that nature. So I will touch base with her tomorrow. And, and I, don't, I don't recall ever getting a call from her, but I'm using three phones right now or two phones, so... No, I understand, yeah. I, I, it went to legal, and I had to yeah. find so out went, what I could respond to. It, so it went, this, the, these questions had to go to legal first. Oh, okay. Because of other things Thank you. occurring that we just need to be co cognizant. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yes, thank you. That's okay. Yeah, cause you weren't, yes, you, you weren't party to all that, so good question, though. The one thing I just want to bring up before we adjourn is... Um, I would like us um, to think about, and I'm, if, if I have your consent to work with staff about adding a item to next agenda so that we can discuss as a group the possible changing of some of our regulations for large buildings. I don't want to use the word moratorium, um, even though if that's what this body wanted to do, why we're changing those regulations. But I just want to add that to our agenda so that we can start discussing this as a group. Um, if we want to have some special regs for large buildings, and I'm not even wanting to determine what large is. That's for us to determine as a group, mm -hmm. you know, not the chairman. So I would like to have your consent to add that as an agenda item for the next meeting. Yep. Everyone can kind of think about where we want to go on that in the next meeting, and we can maybe start that ball processing about doing something different, uh, yes. lack of a better term. Yes. Great. Um, it's a great idea. Lori and Matt? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Matt, there was a consent, uh, unanimous consent for us to add to the next agenda, the beginning of the discussion about um, a moratorium or changing our regulations for large buildings. So however you want to word that for the next agenda would be appropriate. So we can start that discussion. Did you find applications or no? Okay. No, and I know we got, I think, two in, but um, they'll they'll be received. We'll... Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I can't find it right now. I'm just thinking I could go into... Agendas, so what should they put? It's okay. Tell her that's okay. That's okay. okay All right. Answers. What we're going to do is we're, somebody, someone's going to do it. Go ahead. Move to adjourn. Huh? Second. Councilman. Uh, councilman. JC. <laughs> uh, no, Boy, you. that comes back. Um, Commissioner uh, Higley made a motion to adjourn, seconded by Commissioner DeGray. All those in favor? Unanimous to adjourn. We're adjourning this meeting at uh, 1040. Thank you. Good night, everybody.